Eastern, also on C-SPAN. The food industry's private inspection system failed to catch the recent salmonella outbreak that originated at the Peanut Corporation of America, according to a report. Next, a hearing on protecting the nation's food supply. The House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight is chaired by Congressman Bart Stupak of Michigan. It's about two and a half hours. This meeting will come to order. Today we have a hearing titled The Salmonella Outbreak, the, Indus the Salmonella Outbreak, the Industry in Protecting the Nation's Food Supply. The Chairman, Ranking Member, and the Chairman Emeritus will be recognized for five minutes opening statement. Other members of the subcommittee will be recognized for three minutes. I will begin. As the report state, mold was observed growing on the ceiling and walls. Rainwater was observed dripping into the plant's peanut butter processing areas. Six dead mice were found in the false ceiling area. Air filters were littered with feathers. A live roach and several dead roaches were observed in the firm's washroom. REPs, rodent extra pellets, were too numerous to count, were observed. The pictures you are seeing and the quotes I'm reading come from federal inspections of the facilities in Georgia and Texas operated by the Peanut Corporation of America. At the subcommittee's first hearing on February 11, 2009, we heard testimony about filthy conditions and at least a dozen positive salmonella tests that PCA received in 2007 and 2008. Today, the subcommittee will continue its investigation by hearing from representatives of three companies that bought products from these polluted PCA facilities the Kellogg Company, the King Nut Company, and the Vitam Vitamin Cottage Natural Food Markets. We will ask a series of questions today. First, we will ask why their food safety procedures failed to prevent the contamination of their products. The written testimony submitted for today's hearing suggests that some of the companies believe PCA was entirely at fault and that they should not be held responsible for the safety of ingredients they bought from a disreputable supplier. PCA certainly deserves its share of the blame, and there are ongoing criminal investigations of its actions. But all three of these questions put their own labels on these products. They put their names on them. They represented to the public that these products were safe to eat, and they sold them to consumers who became ill and in some cases died. Placing all the blame on PCA would mean that food processors have no responsibility for ensuring the safety of their ingredients, and I simply can't agree with that cannot agree with that. Second, we will ask whether these companies should have known or suspected problems with PCA before the outbreak. In written testimony submitted today, Martin Kanan, the president of CEO of King Nut, states that PCA's president, Stuart Parnell, informed King Nut on January 7, 2009, that he had no knowledge of any salmonella issues with his products. The documents tell a different story. On the same day, January 7, Mr. Parnell, sent an email to King Nut's Vice President for Finance and Administration, Joe Val Valenza. In this email, PCA's President, Mr. Parnell, forwarded a news account of the emerging outbreak to King Nut's Vice President and said, Joe, I'm sure it's something we did. Eleven minutes later, King Nut Vice President replied, I'm recalling everything. Four minutes later, Mr. Parnell replied, Now my heart is really in my throat. I think I'm going to church tonight. Third, we will ask why none of these companies ever asked PCA officials to disclose their positive tests for salmonella. If your supplier tests positive, this is something definitely you should find out, and it's certainly something your customers deserve to know. Even industry insiders recognize this. In an email on February 5, 2009, an official at a private food safety auditing firm wrote to a coal, to a coal worker, the biggest problem with the biggest problem was with the positive microdata that they ignored. This data was not initially available for the FDA either. They re had to really pry into their documentation before uncovering the additional test results. Fourth, we'll ask why these companies relied on audits by AIB, a firm that was selected and paid by PCA. There's an obvious and inherent conflict of interest when an auditor works for the same supplier it is evaluating. 
and several documents show evidence of this cozy relationship. On December 22, 2008, PCA's auditor emailed Sammy Lightsley, the manager of PCA's Georgia plant, to give him advance notice of an upcoming inspection. He stated, you lucky guy, I'm your AIB auditor, so we need to get your plant set for any audit. The result of that audit was a superior rating. The conclusions were completely different when the auditors were not paid by PCA. Today we will release several audits that have yet to be made public. They were concluded not by a PCA uh, auditor hired by PCA, but by internal auditors working for Nestle USA. In 2002, Nestle auditors found the PCA's Georgia facility had no plan to address microbiological hazards like salmonella. Their audit found, quote, potential for microbiological cross-contamination, end of quote, and, and concluded that PCA was not in compliance with housekeeping, sanitation, and pest control standards. The audit noted rodent droppings in the break room cabinets, live flower beetle activity in the blancher room, dead, four dead beetles found in stored screens in the bleacher room, dead insects, in, dead in, insects found on the interior perimeters. The audit warned that it is critical that these de deficiencies are addressed, but its findings in 2002 were similar to the federal investigation several years later. Nestle USA also concluded an audit of PCA's Texas facility in 2006 and came to similar conclusions. As a result, Nestle USA rejected PCA as a supplier. We will ask the other companies here today why they did not do the same. If they had, perhaps some of the illnesses and deaths would have been avoided. In conclusion, I ask unanimous consent that the documents in my opening statement and in the binder prepared by staff be entered into the official record. Without objection, so ordered. I next turn to my friend and colleague, Mr. Walden of Oregon, for an opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Chairman Stupak. Since our last hearing of February 11th, new facts have surfaced and more people have been sickened by salmonella contaminated products produced by Peanut Corporation of America, including 13 cases in my home state of Oregon. The American public and the affected industries remain angry, they remain confused, and they are saddened by the outbreak and subsequent recall, and this frustration is clearly understandable. Now people want to assign blame. I want to go even further. Let's assign some blame and address the weak points in our food safety regulations that allowed this to happen. Let's make this the last time we have to have a hearing to examine what went wrong and finally fix the problems at hand. The current reactive system of random sampling has failed time and again. It brings to mind the famous saying, I think, by uh, Albert Einstein that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We need to shift from the current reactive food safety system that depends heavily on product testing to a proactive and preventive strategy that relies on modern scientific standards and safety controls that detect and eliminate foodborne contamination as far up the chain as possible. I bring to your attention H.R. 1332, the Safe Feast Act, a bipartisan bill that has been introduced by our colleagues, Congressman Jim Costa of California and Adam Putnam of Florida. It does just that. It is my understanding that a similar measure will be introduced in the Senate by Durbin and Gregg. The best chance for achieving our goal is for every participant in every step of the food production and delivery process, from the farm to the retail store, to take a hard look at the way they are doing things now and ask themselves, how can I improve? Then we need to hold their feet to the fire in implementing those improvements. Farmers, retailers, the Food and Drug Administration, the State Health Departments, the companies like the ones who are before us today who purchase products from PCA, and the private third-party audit firms like those that visited PCA and certified them each have a role in improving this process. Peanut Corporation of America is an extreme case of bad actors who, I believe, recklessly endangered consumers, and the majority of the blame rests on their shoulders. PCA allegedly knowingly released contaminated product con to consumers and companies, falsified test results, and violated countless good manufacturing product practices. All of us are disgusted by this continuous abhorrent actions taken by the company. Now, the food processors that I have spoken with in Oregon 
Some large, others smaller, have told me they do not produce or sell items that they would not feed their own children or their grandchildren. They have extensive vendor certification processes. They go through third-party audits, and each of them know that it is in their company's best interest and their consumers, because without that, it is impossible to stay in business. PCA did not operate by these standards. I want to put up a couple of pictures as well. On the screen are pictures taken at PCA's plant in Plainview, Texas, where contaminated products were produced and shipped into commerce. This is a picture that you really need to understand. This is the intake screen over the air that goes into where the food's already been processed. Now, it's hard to really see clearly what's on this screen, but it doesn't take much imagination to believe there's at least one rotting rodent on that screen. These two pictures that follow are also of dead rodents. And what is especially disgusting are these are rodents that, again, are around the air intake that brought air in, in theory, pure air, brought it in and put it over the processed product. How does this go undetected in initial screenings? How do auditors go in and not spot this in the beginning? How did this company get a clean third-party audit? Something's wrong with the system. These, these, these are dead rodents and other contaminants that were present on and around PCA's air handling equipment that, as I said, blows fresh air onto clean peanut products. Media outlets report that this PCA plant had not been inspected by Texas health regulators or the FDA. That is because PCA violated the law by failing to register and apply for a food manufacturing license from the state. Another example of PCA's abhorrent behavior. Hopefully the companies here today can help us understand what they currently do to ensure the quality and safety of their products and identify potential places for improvement. What are their supplier qualifications and should more be required? What do their internal quality assurance programs look like and what enhancements can be made? These three companies represent a variety of food manufacturers, including large established companies that have been in business for decades to small family-run companies that were all negatively impacted by PCA's recall. We need your help in designing a process that works for the safety of food in America. Testimony today may be useful to enhance our legislative efforts, but the subcommittee should keep this case study in context because the deaths and illnesses from this outbreak were caused by one bad actor who clearly, in my opinion, violated the law. So the best way to protect young children like three-year-old Jake Hurley from my home state of Oregon is to prevent poisonings by stopping bad actors like PCA. The smart and most cost-effective way is to build in preventive food safety measures at firms and increase the strength of regulatory inspections by giving FDA access to all test results, especially those that are positive for contaminants during inspections, and expose and deter the bad actors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Walden. Mr. Waxman, for opening statement, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to commend you for the tenacious way that you have uh, held hearings and tried to expose what is going on in the food safety area, especially the glaring holes at all levels of our food safety network. This is the third hearing our committee has held on the question of food safety. At our first hearing in February, it was clear that Peanut Corporation of America was more interested in its financial well-being than the health and safety of its customers. Rather than expressing regrets or sorrow uh, for the illnesses the company caused, we saw internal communications where the company was more concerned about the fact they were losing money and more concerned about their financial bottom line. At that hearing, we also heard from the Food and Drug Administration about the authorities it lacks. The FDA doesn't even have the authority to routinely access records documenting the steps manufacturers take to assure safety. FDA can't even order a company to recall dangerous food products. It can only make a request and then hope the company complies. Well, then in March, we held our committee's second hearing before the Subcommittee on Health, where the legislation will be considered. At that hearing, witnesses explained that FDA cannot solve these critical problems alone. We rely on FDA, but there are over 300,000 
registered food facilities throughout the U.S. and abroad, so we can't expect the FDA to prevent foodborne illnesses through inspections or post hoc investigations. So we rely on the companies, and today we're going to examine the role of industry in protecting our nation's food supply. We've got three companies that we're going to hear from today. They purchase peanut products from PCA. Despite the filthy conditions at PCA's plants in Georgia and Texas, these companies relied on PCA's uh, review of the salmonella problem. Uh, they uh, included uh, them in their, they, took, they bought the products from PCA and then they took these uh, purchases and put it under their own label and then they sold it to the public. Well, when we heard from Dr. Stephen Sundloff of FDA, uh, Director of Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, he said each company in the chain of manufacturing has an obligation to ensure that the ingredients they're using as well as their final products are safe for Americans to consume. And I wholeheartedly agree. Nestle was going to buy products from PCA, and, but Nestle sent its own auditors out, their own inspectors. And they found that the place was filthy. And they realized that it was going to be a danger to their customers, so they didn't buy the products. Uh, Kellogg uh, realized that there may be a problem, but they insisted that PCA get its own inspection done, which PCA did by hiring a third party auditor to inspect the facilities of their suppliers. And what they found was that under this third party system, there was a for profit auditing firm called AIB. And they gave PCA glowing reviews. This company was selected by PCA. It was paid by PCA. It reported to PCA. And it realized that if they didn't give a good review, they were going to be hired again. So they did an audit. And then they gave, gave PCA a certificate of achievement. Peanut Corporation of America was considered superior that's what the auditors said about the Peanut Corporation of America. At the same time, we have these horrible pictures of what was going on with rats and infestations in these plants. Now, the question I think we want to know is how is it possible for a company that looks like this, with pictures of rodents, receive an award like this, where they're called superior? Uh, I think it, it raises the serious question of the flaw of these third party inspections where there's a clear conflict of interest by the third party inspector. And when you add to that what might be happening internationally, uh, where uh, third parties, foreign third parties are inspecting foods that we import into this country, it really has to make you think that there's something wrong and we've got, to, uh, we've got to clarify the situation, we've got to correct it. Our goal now is to develop common sense legislation to improve preventive services at the front end of this pro process before one more person dies from tainted food. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Deal from Georgia, opening statement, three minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding the hearing. Thanks to our witnesses for being here. Obviously, all of us, regardless of which side of the aisle we sit on, are very concerned about keeping the food supply of this country safe. The, that is a function that I see, as has already been stated, is a dual function. First of all, it is primarily preventive in nature. We must try to make sure that nothing contaminates that food supply, if at all possible, to prevent it. And that, too, is a bifurcated uh, function. It is the function of private industry those who produce, those who process, and those who distribute. And then there's a function of the federal government, and that is more or less oversight of all of those functions. The panel's uh, makeup today, obviously, will focus on uh, the industry side of the agenda. And there's some, some important questions I think we all need to ask, and that is, 
what should we legislatively require in terms of prevention that we're not doing currently? For example, should there be certification of independent third party uh, auditors? Should there be certification of independent labs? Should there be mandatory testing of product? And if so, how, how often and at what stage of the processes? Should those reports from those uh, tests be made available to inspectors, both FDA, USDA, uh, and third party inspectors when they come to look at the facilities that are involved? Uh, these are all questions that are legitimate, but I think we all understand that a lot can be done on the private side of the, of the ledger and perhaps more should be done on the government side. I hope today's uh, testimony will allow us to make some interaction between those two separate private and governmental functions so that we know and have direction as to how we should approach this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Mr. Dingell, for an opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I commend you for holding this hearing and for your longstanding effort to fix food and drugs so that they can do their job the way it should be done. We have been working on this in this committee for several years. As you will recall, last Congress, you, Mr. Chairman, and I spent considerable time trying to get the story of food drugs incompetence, inability to carry out its responsibility, lack of resources, and general overall indifference to its responsibility at leadership levels was a source of considerable interest by this subcommittee. I would note that we are now talking about dreadful lapses in accountability by state and federal regulators, as well as members of the industry in ensuring safety of the nation's food supply. This is not a new thing. We had the grapes, we had the jalapeno peppers and tomatoes. We had a severe problem with imported Chinese seafood and shellfish. We've had terrific problems with imported heparin. And now we've got the peanuts. And you, Mr. Chairman, and I have found reason to be highly critical of food and drug for lack of resources and for basic statute, which has not really been changed since 1962. As I made clear uh, then in the subcommittee's previous hearings, this is not a new problem. Nine hearings were held by this subcommittee in the prior Congress, and we questioned the system designed to protect Americans from dangerous foods and drugs, and how it was not working, and how food and drug did not have the resources. At a cost of sickening nearly 700 people, probably killing nine, costing our state of Michigan alone $1 million to combat, depriving other businesses of revenues due to recalls. And I note that other businesses have been hurt by this as well as American consumers, who, who unfortunately have been killed and sickened. Uh, and I would note that the most recent outbreak of salmonella is clearly a result of deplorably unsanitary conditions at the Peanut Corporations of America, Georgia, and Texas plant. And it clearly illustrates the need for overhaul of our system for protecting the nation's food and drug supply is long overdue. And I would note that when Georgia, well, first of all, food and drug never got in to look at the place, but finally Georgia went in after eight years of inaction by FDA under delegated authority from FDA, and they couldn't find a thing. Apparently, nobody in that business of inspection can find anything, including the seat of the pants with two hands. In any event, last month's hearing dealt with federal and state regulatory faults that contributed to the peanut butter related salmonella outbreak. What concerns us today is the role of industry in protecting health and safety of American consumers. Nestle, for example, refused to contract PCA as a supplier due to the fact that in its own due diligence, it found unsanitary conditions at PCA's processing facilities. 
Georgian Food and Drug couldn't and didn't. At all the same, I understand that diligence is not uniform across the industry. And I intend to ask our witnesses frank questions about their operational protocols related to ensuring safety of the products supplied to them for final processing. It might be noted that they are showing an extraordinary level of trust in a system and an agency that do not work. I wish to learn what best practices they have in place for protecting consumer health and safety, as well as if they monitor the sanitary conditions at suppliers' processing facilities. Finally, I'd like to ask the witnesses assembled here today to state for the record if they support increased and strengthened authorities for food and drug and adequate resources and funding and whether they're willing to pay a, a registration charge to see to it that Food and Drug has the funds and the resources which this skin flint Congress has never given them. Mr. Chairman, you, Chairman Pallone, and I have introduced H.R. 759, the Food and Drug Administration Globalization Act of 2009, which will guarantee a reliable stream of resources through registration fees on food manufacturers to support increased inspection of foreign and domestic processing plants by FDA. This bill is predicated on the notion that FDA must be strengthened not by replacing it with some new questionable food safety agency, uh, bringing new layers of, of bureaucracy into the system, and whether that will come at too great a cost for the taxpayers. It's my hope that the witnesses today will recognize the urgency of enacting H.R. 759 and offer their support. It's a sensible bill that will protect American consumers from farm to fork. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Bedingo. Uh, Mr. Burgess, for opening statement, please, three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the, uh, and I appreciate the witnesses being here today. Uh, this is so important that we get this right going forward because as Mr. Dingle already pointed out, we've had hearing after hearing after hearing. We've really done nothing about the problem. It is time for us to move on this. And it is also so important for us to get the policy right because as we see, if we get the policy wrong, people lose lives, not to mention the amount of dollars that have been lost in, the, in this recent problem. And the aftermath of this recent outbreak of salmonella are still being felt. I think your sales have dramatically decreased and the recalls are still being issued. None of us are satisfied with the lack of answers from the Peanut Corporation of America in our hearing earlier in February. We hold this hearing now to determine how the industry should move forward. And the problems are not just with the industry. Most companies want to maintain the integrity of their product and their trust and the relationship they have with the American people, the American consumer, and they have in place good manufacturing procedures. But when that trust is broken by bad actors like the Peanut Corporation of America, controls must be in place to swiftly address and correct the problem. And I'm not an expert in food safety, but this is not microbiological rocket science. You heat the peanuts up to a temperature that is high enough to kill the bugs for long enough. And then if your plant isn't just in violation of every code, your product's going to be OK. It's so easy. It doesn't require anything exotic like radiation or some, some new procedure. It's as old as, as peanut preparation has always been. It's not that hard to do. So that's why it just defies logic and defies gravity that PCA wouldn't take the, the, the necessary steps. The logical path forward, uh, it, how should Congress address this food sa safety legislation? Well, currently, the Food and Drug Administration, in my opinion, is missing three logical controls which would allow, would allow them to effectively, efficiently, and expeditiously clamp down on foodborne illness. And the first, the first is access to records. Currently, the Food and Drug Administration has no power to get the full records of a company. Instead, we're like the other, the federal agency is like children requesting from a parent to have something that they may not, to which they may not be entitled. The Food and Drug Administration has to politely ask the company for a position that defies logic. When food safety, when a food safety crisis is in place, the Food and Drug Administration should not have to ask permission to go in for those records. They should be given the power uh, to, to obtain those records. Second, we've got to modernize the traceability of the system through greater use of electronics. Now, we in the medical profession are routinely excoriated for the slowness with which we adopt electronic medical records, but 
The Food and Drug Administration has come to this committee and testified that more than 90 percent of their records are on paper so that when there is a food-related problem, the staff at the Food and Drug Administration is digging through boxes and boxes in some warehouse to find out who did what to whom when. These should be converted to an easily navigable electronics database. Also, companies should use the hazard access critical control point. The Food and Drug Administration currently requires juice companies and seafood companies to use this system, and the USDA already requires all meat and poultry companies to use this system, so it seems like it would be logical to require all domestic food products to do so as well. Third, the Food and Drug Administration should have the power of mandatory recalls. If a company does not voluntarily pull its products and they have been identified to contain foodborne illnesses, then the Food and Drug Administration should have the power to mandatorily recall this product. Unfortunately, with food safety, when questions arise, the product is guilty and less proven innocent, and that's the, that's the, the, the legacy that we're going to be left with because of bad actors in the business. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Get for an opening statement, please, three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we have had a series of hearings. I think this is about the 13th of them now. And um, I'm always sorry to be here because what that means is we haven't solved the problem yet. This, this uh, Peanut Corporation of America situation reminds me of one of the case studies that we studied in law school because it's all there. All of the things we need to do in food safety are present here. We need to have the third party inspections. We need to have the mandatory record provision. We need to have mandatory recall authority. And we need to have traceability. And all of these companies who are here today will talk to us about how having bad suppliers, having bad actors, can affect all of the food industry. I particularly want to welcome Ms. Isley here today uh, from Colorado and from Vitamin Cottage, a well-known business that um, I've known for years, ever since I was a young girl growing up in Denver. I think Vitamin Cottage is a good example of, of sort of the collateral damage that can happen when you have bad actors in the food system. Because this is a small, family-run, organic foods grocer, which gets its, um, its food and its provisions from a lot of different suppliers. It's all well and good to say that it's their responsibility at Vitam Vitamin Cottage to inspect all of the people that provide them food. But in truth, it's virtually impossible for a small business to do that. And in this case, um, and I'll be interested to hear Ms. Isley talk about this, is they actually received assurances from Peanut Corporation of America that these peanuts were being produced in a healthful way. And frankly, if you're a small natural foods grocer, the last thing that you want to do is be making people sick because that's going to affect your ability to do business and it's going to affect your bottom line. And so, and so instead, I think what we need to look at in this committee is how we can ensure that the whole food chain, the whole food supply chain is safe. That means the things that I talked about a few minutes ago and that everybody on both sides of the aisle in this committee is talking about. Um, and finally, I will say, I think that the Vitamin Cottage experience is a good example of how traceability can actually work well. Because once these patients were identified by the Colorado Department of Health as having been sickened by salmonella, we were able to trace rather quickly back to where these peanuts came from. And so I think that uh, I think that if we could institute traceability throughout the whole system, we may well have identified this problem much sooner. We may have been able to recall the peanut, but peanuts much sooner. Many hundreds, fewer people would have been sickened, and we might have even been able to save some lives. So I'm eager to hear from our witnesses today. I think they will add a very valuable perspective into the putting all the puzzle pieces together to solve this uh, broken system. Thank you. Mr. Gingrey, uh, opening statement, please, sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I want to say to Mr. Kanan and uh, Ms. Isley that uh, I agree with uh, Congresswoman DeGette in regard to the collateral damage. I, I want to admit also that I'm a physician member almost addicted to peanut butter. Uh, and, and also at the age where I have to take a number of medications on a regular basis. And let me assure you, 
when it says don't take on an empty stomach with a little bit of peanut butter, the medicine goes down in the most delightful way. And that's what I generally do with a number of my pills and capsules. And, and uh, now I have to worry about whether or not salmonella is going down with me, which is a shame. And, and uh, of course, it, we're talking about one, one very bad actor who, whose uh, uh, headquarters is not in Georgia, but certainly the plant was in Georgia. There's no question but that the safety of the American people is first and foremost responsibility of government at every level, from providing for our national defense, indeed, to protecting our nation's food supply. Our responsibility today is to get to the bottom of this most recent salmonella outbreak, knowing that what we learn will inform the legislative work, not just of this subcommittee, but the other subcommittees and the full committee. However, we must all, I think, keep in perspective that we live in a world of almost infinite needs, uh, but definitely finite resources. Of course, I'm talking about money. We also should not lose sight of the fact that at the core of this particular outbreak is an individual company, PCA, and ownership that acted, in my opinion, criminally. As I stated at the last oversight hearing, regardless of how high a regulatory wall we erect, there's always going to be someone brazen enough or stupid enough or greedy enough to try to climb over it. So let us remember that we should also review the penalties for folks who knowingly, knowingly circumvent our food safety system. But Mr. Chairman, I, with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. Mr. Braley, for opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Walden for holding this follow-up hearing. Uh, last year, I spent a lot of time back in my district visiting elementary schools, sitting in school cafeterias, talking to young children about the importance of food safety. And if you have any doubt about the importance of this hearing today, I would urge you all to go visit an elementary school in your district during lunchtime and sit down and talk to kids about what impact food safety has on their lives. This hearing is particularly timely for me because as a member of Congress from Iowa, at least 27 confirmed cases of salmonella traced to alfalfa sprouts have been identified in my state in recent weeks. The infected sprouts were sold by an Omaha company to food distributors in Iowa and Nebraska who further sold the product to grocery stores and restaurants. And while the outbreak of salmonella linked to PCA peanut products has received much more attention on a national basis because of the sheer number of illnesses and products recalled, this more recent outbreak, which has led to over 70 confirmed salmonella cases in four states, provides evidence that the PCA salmonella outbreak was not just an isolated incident and reminds us all of the urgency of fixing our food safety system. This outbreak in Iowa also emphasizes something that was abundantly clear at last month's hearing. We need to enact comprehensive reforms to our food safety system that will necessarily encompass the entire food industry. As you all know, we heard troubling testimony about the unsanitary and unsafe conditions at PCA last month, and that led to hundreds of illnesses and as many as nine deaths nationwide. We also learned about the failure of the FDA and state investigations to identify problems at PCA and about the FDA's limited remedies under current law. That's why this hearing is so important. As Ms. DeGette pointed out, we're going to keep revisiting this subject until we get it right and until there's no longer a need to hold these repeated follow-up hearings. And that's why I want to thank the chairman and ranking member for their interest in getting this in information out to the public in such a timely manner. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Braley. Ms. Sutton, please, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for holding the second hearing on the Salmonella outbreak and FDA oversight. At the last hearing, it became very, very apparent that uh, the safety of our food supply is not as it should be. The salmonella outbreak that originated from Peanut Corporation of America has taken a disproportionate toll on Ohio. Um, I have mentioned it before, but since October 2008, Ohio has reported 100 cases, including two deaths due to salmonella. This is far more than any other state. What is perhaps even more alarming is that there are still cases being reported. I'd like to draw your attention to a news article from March 13th titled, Salmonella Cases, Half Still Come from Crackers, Recalled Food Continues to Sicken Consumers. The article states that nearly two months after the initial recall and despite massive publicity, 
Federal health officials are still worried that some consumers have not gotten the message. There are families who keep peanut butter crackers in their cupboards and may not realize that they were recalled. Worse yet, there are reports that some stores have not pulled the contaminated products from their shelves. The bottom line, Mr. Chairman, is that even though these products were recalled, the execution of the recall was flawed. That's why it's so important for Congress to fix our food safety system, and I applaud your willingness to take on this task. Currently, the FDA lacks the authority to issue mandatory recalls of tainted products. Furthermore, the FDA does not require proof that recalled products have been destroyed. I introduced the Protect Consumers Act, which gives the FDA mandatory recall authority. I also support other legislation sponsored by many in this committee that call for better reporting for contaminated products and tracing products once they are recalled. I'm interested in hearing from our panel today that represents companies affected by the outbreak. I'm especially eager to hear from Mr. Kane and from King Nut Company, which is in Northeast Ohio. And Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you and all of our colleagues to fix our broken food inspection system. And I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Schakowsky, opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. Ensuring safety of our food supply is a critical priority for this committee and this Congress, and I'm pleased that we're moving forward on this legislation. I began my career uh, as a consumer product safety advocate, as a very young housewife in Illinois, I won't give you the year, um, who just wanted to pick, a, pick something off the, a grocery shelf and know how long it had been sitting there, a day, a week, and, uh, and a year. And along with a, a group, a small group of other similarly minded young housewives, and with a tremendous amount of perseverance, we succeeded in getting freshness dates on food packages. There was never any regulation, but the, the freshness Dating, um, what, which is now ubiquitous, began to roll like a snowball. Um, we, we never thought that another label might be needed, salmonella free. This is the second hearing held by the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee on the recent horrible outbreak of salmonella linked to the Peanut Corporation of America. According to the Illinois Department of Health, to date, 10 individuals in my state have been made ill by that strain of salmonella. As of March 1st, CDC has documented 677 illnesses nationwide, um, with one in four people hospitalized. Um, and you know about the, uh, the deaths. This outbreak has disproportionately affected the young, a population even more likely than adults to consume peanut butter and peanut butter products. Products. Half of those made sick were children under the age of 16, and one in five were children under the age of five. In February, we heard testimony from Peter Hurley, whose young son was made ill by eating Austin peanut butter crackers. Those crackers found in millions of homes across the country were made by the Kellogg Company using peanut paste sold by Peanut Corporation of America. I, along with many others, um, was shocked by documents presented in the February hearing that showed that PCA knew that their products were tainted and yet released them into the food supply anyway. This recklessness and negligence have caused the deaths of nine people. There are many places where the system broke down. One, the Peanut Corporation of America was not required to report to anyone, not the FDA, not the companies buying their peanuts when their products tested positive for salmonella. Two, the private companies that audited PCA were not subject to uniform standards or apparently strong enough standards as the FDA found many violations not reported in the private company's earlier audits. Three, the FDA had to use its authority under the Bioterrorism Act just to gain access to PCA's files showing their product had tested positive for salmonella. We can and we must do better than that. And I hope today's hearing and testimony from companies that purchase products from PCA will help us identify how we can improve our food safety system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Well, that concludes the opening statements by all members of the panel. I should point out Mr. Schauer is here from uh, Michigan. Uh, he's talked to the members uh, individually throughout this uh, course of it. Uh, you have Kellogg's in your district, right? Uh, Mr. La Tourette, who I thought would be stopping by, but I know he's talked to a number of members about this. He has uh, King Nut in his district, and of course, Mr. Get uh, has uh, the other vitamin, cottage, natural food markets. I have trouble with that one, but uh, she's been there. So I would not be surprised to see members come back and forth. There are other hearings going on and other panels that they have to be at, but uh, I expect members come in and out, and they'd be recognized as they came in. So let's call our, our first uh, panel of witnesses uh, to the table. I'd like to welcome these witnesses and thank them for testifying today. 
I want to make one thing clear. While your companies are those that have been directly linked to the illnesses, the CDC acknowledges that, uh, that their products, your products, do not explain all of the illnesses associated with this salmonella outbreak. There are many other companies that purchase products from PCA and have contributed to the salmonella outbreak. Uh, these companies have been cooperative, have voluntarily come forward, and they have worked with the CDC, FDA, and others to try to get some our hands around this uh, salmonella outbreak, the largest uh, food outbreak of uh, foodborne illness in our country. So I would like to welcome our panel. And first we have Mr. Martin Kanan, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the King Nut Company based in Ohio. We have Mr. David Mackay, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Kellogg Company based in Michigan. And we have Ms. Heather Isley, who is the co-owner of the Vitamin Cottage Natural Food Markets Incorporated based in Colorado. Welcome you all. It is the policy of this subcommittee to take our testimony under oath. Please be advised that under the rules of the House you have the right to have and be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do any of you wish to be, uh, have counsel with you and wish to be advised by counsel during your testimony? Mr. Ken, would you just identify who they are for the record? Push the button. Yeah. I have um, Valoria Hoover and Ann Corrigan. Okay. Mr. McKay? Yes, so I have uh, Charles uh, Sklosky. Okay, very good. Ms. Isley? Yeah. I have with me uh, Mr. Barnett from Steptoe and Johnson. Okay. During the testimony, if we ask questions, if you want to consult with them or be advised by them, that's great, uh, but you would be the one who would answer the questions, okay? All right, I'm going to ask you to uh, please rise and raise your right hand and take the oath. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, matter pending before this committee? Okay, let the record reflect that witnesses have replied in the affirmative. They are now under oath. We will hear a five-minute opening statement. We have your longer statements you have submitted for the record. I and others, I am sure, of the committee have read your opening statements. So if you want to give us five minutes, please, we would appreciate it. Mr. Cannon, let's start with you. On my, am I saying that right? Cannon? Cannon? Cannon. Cannon. Got it. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is Martin Kanan, and I am the President and CEO of Kanan Enterprises, better known as King Nut. We are a family-owned and operated business and are a leading national supplier of snack nuts and other snack foods. Let me begin by saying something you have heard many times. The health and safety of those who consume our products is our first priority. Kanan has always reviewed its processes to identify lessons learned. Such continuous improvement is how we grew from 25 employees in 1989 to almost 200 today. Our uh, union-run facilities by the Teamsters produce nearly 500 million bags of products per year, none of which is associated with this outbreak. We began selling peanut butter because our customers asked us for it. However, we are not a peanut butter manufacturer. In early, in early 2004, PCA started as King Nut's private labeler of peanut butter. This means they supplied us finished product in a sealed container, packed by them, with our label put on by them in a closed and finished case. Throughout the five years of doing business with PCA, we received spec sheets for their products highlighting that no salmonella be present. We also received several continuing pure food guarantees that stated any product shipped to us would be unadulterated, safe, and free from any substance which would harm the consumer. They also gave us certificates of insurance, a total quality systems audit summary report, a letter from Stuart Parnell, PCA's president, extolling a superior rating from AIB, and assurances that PCA had a HACCP plan in place. Late in the relationship, we received COAs that showed negative results for salmonella. By the end of 2008, we distributed the PCA peanut butter to seven food service distributors. We did not suspect health issues existed with the PCA product until we were contacted by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. We were the very first in the United States to do the voluntary recall for any product associated with this salmonella outbreak. On Wednesday, January 7th, we received a call from the MDA informing us they were investigating the salmonella incidents. They wanted to know who manufactured the King Nut peanut butter, and we told them it was PCA. 
When we contacted PCA, Stuart Parnell, their president, informed us he had no knowledge of a salmonella issue. On the next day, FDA investigators came to our facilities. We produced bills of ladings and COAs from PCA. We asked the FDA to take samples of the peanut butter to test, but they declined. Therefore, on the same day, we sent samples ourselves of the lots of peanut butter we had in-house to be tested. Also on the same day, we received a second call from the MDA informing us that the peanut, uh, the peanut butter was a possible suspect uh, from an open container that had been sent out for testing. The next day, Friday, January 9th, the FDA investigators again returned to our facility. We informed them we did not use any peanut butter in any of the products we manufactured. Several hours later, the FDA investigators then took samples of the peanut butter we had for testing. At 4.30 that Friday afternoon, we received news from the MDA that sampling from the open container of peanut butter had a presumptive positive for salmonella and that the subtype would not be confirmed until the following week. Now, even though it was a single container, and even though it was only a presumptive positive, we decided to do the recall. We did not want to wait for PCA. Our biggest concern was for the health and safety of our customers. So prior to noon that Saturday, January 10th, over the weekend, we initiated the first product recall associated with this salmonella outbreak. We recalled all of the PCA peanut butter that King Nut distributed in 2008. All of our seven food service distributors were aware of the recall that same afternoon. That day we also issued a nationwide press release as we did not know who might the ultimate customer or consumer be. On Monday, January 12th, the FDA investigators again came to gather more information. We were also call, uh, called and informed that four of the 13 samples from that open container had tested positive for Salmonella typhimurium. This confirmed that our quick reaction to the uh, presumptive positive was the right thing to do. Three days after we initiated the recall, PCA did. As this subcommittee is aware, PCA's recall has been expanded many times. We, along with those in our industry and the consumers, were shocked and dismayed at findings that PCA knowingly released product with potential salmonella contamination into the food supply. The test results from our January 8th in-house samples were negative. To this day, FDA has not told us the results of those January 9th samples they took from our warehouse. Now, while I believe that the American food supply is one of the safest in the world, Canaan Enterprises continues to be committed to work at rebuilding public confidence in the American food safety system. I want to be a part of making things better for our country's food supply. In this specific case of PCA, I must reiterate that we did not have control over the production nor the processing of this product. While most food manufacturers practice safe production, storage, and handling of food ingredients, it is apparent if someone lacks the integrity and honesty, they will always be able to find ways to bypass any equality assurance or food safety program. We need to let the American public know that we have better systems in place to react quickly, to correct our problems, and punish the wrongdoer. This is a tragedy for all of those involved, the victims, the families, our industry, I thank you for this opportunity to discuss these issues with you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mackay, will your opening statement, please. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm David Mackay, President and CEO of the Kellogg Company. We sell our products here and in more than 180 countries and employ more than 32,000 people. Uh, first and foremost, we deeply regret that the recent salmonella recall situation occurred and that it involved Kellogg products. We apologise to our customers and consumers, especially those who have become ill from one of our products. Uh, we, just like members of the subcommittee, federal and state regulators, medical professionals and the general public, are deeply disturbed by the events we've learned of over the past two months with respect to Peanut Corporation of America. We thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss these important issues in particular, how we can work together to strengthen the safety of the US food supply. PCA has essentially poisoned the well for an industry in which most companies are honest and trustworthy and pride themselves on delivering safe, wholesome products that consumers expect and deserve. The PCA situation has shown that if a company chooses to ignore 
even basic food safety principles, food safety systems and protections can be compromised. One of our governing values is to have the humility and hunger to learn. With that focus, our food safety program operates on the principle that food safety is a process of continuous improvement. And in that spirit, and as a result of what we've learned from this unfortunate situation, we've taken several immediate actions to enhance our food safety efforts. We established new Kellogg cross-functional teams, including quality, food safety and engineering groups to audit suppliers of high-risk ingredients and have completed these on-site audits of our peanut and peanut paste ingredient suppliers. We're also requiring these suppliers to conduct environmental testing and monitoring in their plants, which we believe from our own practices is pivotal in identifying, assessing and correcting potential contamination before it becomes a major food safety problem and we're strengthening our internal food safety training and education across our supply chain. In the US food safety system, we believe the key to enhancement is a renewed focus on prevention, so that potential sources of contamination are identified and properly addressed before they become actual food safety problems. My written statement outlines our recommendations, however, I'd like to provide highlights of our proposals. We support the following nine industry and government enhancements. One, establish a single food safety authority under Health and Human Services, supported by a food safety advisory council to strengthen and maximize the efficiency of regulatory oversight. Two, establish an international food protection training institute to train government and industry inspectors. Three, improve current good manufacturing practices or GMPs which have not been updated for over 22 years. Four, develop food safety plans for every food facility that are based on a thorough risk assessment and contain verification systems and preventative controls. Five, require annual FDA inspections of facilities that produce high risk foods. Six, require test results and corrective actions to be disclosed to FDA at that annual inspection. Seven, develop consistent food manufacturing audit standards and accredit auditors and the audit firms. Eight, provide FDA with mandatory recall authority to expedite necessary recalls. And finally, nine, review possibilities for enhancing traceability standards. Kellogg is firmly committed to working together with Congress, industry and other stakeholders to evaluate and advance these recommendations. I look forward to discussing them with you today and I want to thank you on behalf of the company and our employees for this opportunity to discuss these important issues and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Mackay. Ms. Hensley, uh, your uh, opening statement, please. Good morning, Chairman. I'm going to ask you to pull that mic up a little bit so we can hear you. Can you? Okay. Good morning, Chairman Stupek, Ranking Member Walden, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Heather C. Isley, and I am Executive Vice President and part owner of Vitamin Cottage Natural Food Markets, Inc. We very much appreciate the opportunity to provide our input to the subcommittee on our involvement with the Piedmont Corporation of America and to provide insight on how outbreaks like this one are dealt with by small chain retailers. Vitamin Cottage was established in 1955 by my parents. They started the business by going door to door in Golden, Colorado, selling whole grain bread and sharing nutrition information with people they met. I started working for my parents at the store when I was nine years old. Our goals have always been the same, providing exceptional customer service, extensive nutrition education, and the highest quality products at affordable prices. For over 30 years, Natural Grocers has offered fresh grown peanut butter, our employees make peanut butter in the store by running dry roasted peanuts through a small grinder. For the past few years, the dry roasted peanuts for this product have been purchased from PCA from its Plainview, Plainview Texas facility. Until the PCA outbreak, Natural Grocers has never had any adverse health issues associated with its peanut butter. The timeline with respect to developments related to PCA supplied products is well known. For our part, despite continuing quality assurances from personnel at the PCA Texas plant, Natural Grocers quarantined its inventory of PCA peanut products on January 28th. 
On January 30th, Natural Grocers preemptively and voluntarily recalled all related products and began notifying customers to return all previously purchased fresh ground peanut butter. We have detailed how we subsequently worked with the government authorities in our written testimony. As a family-owned retailer, we are deeply concerned about the obvious breakdown in the regulatory system that brought about the PCA-based outbreak. We need effective laws and regulations that ensure we buy food with confidence in its safety. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today. And and assisting us with this investigation. Um, they're giving you a document book there because I'm going to ask about document number 48 and 49 in my first question. You know, we've seen the photos, and I think the chairman and uh, Mr. Walden and others, and we've all had those photos uh, of the dead rodents and other filthy conditions at PCA. And you've heard what governor invest government investigators found when they went in to shut down these facilities, roaches, salmonella contamination, and so much rodent excrement that they couldn't uh, really quantify how much there was. And, and, and I've read your statements and I've listened to you here closely this morning. And essentially what you're all saying is that you didn't know about the, these problems at PCA. Uh, but my question is, why didn't you know? I mean, I understand there was the audit firm AIB that inspected PCA and gave it very high ratings of excellent or superior. But yet in our investigation, we find AIB gives 98% of everyone they inspect superior or excellent ratings. Um, but the companies, you didn't do your own inspections like Nestle did, and, and therefore you didn't find the problems. So in, our, in the audits there, if you look at uh, number 48 and 49, if you'd like, they're in the document binder. First one, 48, is 2002 Nestle USA sent auditors to the PCA facility in Georgia where they found, quote, the potential for microbiological cross-contamination because of raw peanuts being handled in the peanut roasting area. They found rodent droppings in the break room cabinets, live flower beetle activity, and dead end insects. Ultimately, they concluded in 2002, Nestle did, PCA was not in compliance with critical standards for housekeeping, sanitation, pest control, and they found PCA had no plan to address salmonella. Nestle USA then went in 2006 at the invite to go to PCA in Texas in 2006 and found a failure to comply with pathogen monitoring and pest control standards. According to the tab 49, the 206 report, the auditors counted over 50 mouse or rat carcasses, concluding that the facility had, quote, a serious ongoing problem with rodents. As a result of these deficiencies, Nestle said no in 2002 and 2006. Again, they said no and rejected PCA as a supplier, that they wouldn't buy peanut products from them. The difference, it seems, that Nestle didn't rely solely on an auditor that was selected by PCA and paid by PCA, which is an obvious conflict of interest. It conducted its own audits with its own experienced staff. So let me ask each of you today, why didn't you do the same? You all talked about safety is the number one concern, family-owned companies, you're doing everything you can to assure the safety, but it seems like you've passed that responsibility to somebody else. So why wouldn't you have done the same thing if this is your supplier of a critical ingredient? Why wouldn't you go check it? Uh, Mr. Cannon, you want to start with you? Thank you, Congressman. We, uh, first, when we started out in the relationship, we required spec sheets from them. We relied on the FDA that's supposed to be doing that. They certainly come visit us. We run a very clean shop and organization. They're very well known in the industry. We had a continuing pure food guarantee from them. Throughout the relationship, we continued to ask for more things like HACCP plans. We believe they had a HACCP plan in place. And uh, we got, had COA showing negative results for salmonella by the end. <clears throat> right, we, I know. We were that. outraged. But, but why, didn't, why didn't you guys go check? If this is your main supplier to provide your peanut butter, they're putting your name on this, what, five pound uh, five pail pounds. and then up to 35 pounds and goes to like nursing homes and that. Why didn't you go check? We were a distributor of this. I understand our name was on it. But we bought a closed container, and that's where we have to look at today. We have got to start with the manufacturers, the distributors, the retailers okay. down the line. Okay, I'll, I'll follow that up with a question. Uh, Kellogg's, you're, you're a big company like Nestle, and I, I was surprised you guys didn't at least have someone there, internal audits. Yeah, I think, w 
as we said in our written, but I'll, I'll go through it. We, we use a multi-step process. The third party audit. Can you pull your mic up a little bit, Mr. Yeah, Mankai? The third party audit is uh, one step in that. Uh, we also do risk analysis of ingredients. Uh, we, we bring the, the, the product into our uh, labs to run it through our facilities, make sure it works so we get first-hand experience with that and we do get certificates of analysis. Yeah, but do you send people out to these plants? Some we do, uh, some we don't. Uh, the practicality is when you look at Kellogg, even as a big company, we sure. have 3,000 uh, ingredients, 1,000 suppliers. Um, I think it's common industry practice to use a third party. Uh, if you look at the situation here, uh, AIB is the most commonly used auditor in the US. Uh, the AIB, as one of many factors we use, is meaningful. The AIB audit confirmed Several important food safety measures were in place at PCA. They had an environmental testing program. They they did all micro biological sure, but, finish. But you didn't send anyone down or like Nestle like to p check PCA, right? You didn't send anyone down to Kellogg's in? We, we didn't at that point, but we have since, as a learning coming out After, of this, yeah. uh, changed our Okay, I'm, I'm going to follow that up with a question because yeah. you all got different standards here now on what you're doing. That's my next question. Ms. Isley, any comment on that? You guys didn't send anyone? You're, you're the family-owned one that health is your concern. Did, did you guys send anyone to PCA in Texas or? We did not send anyone. Sorry, Chairman. That's right. Um, this is, I'm not used to this. I'm from small family-run business. Sorry. Um, a little bit nervous today. That's good. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, we did not send anyone to PCA. Um, one of the things that as a small family-run business of a chain of retail stores, we have 1,300 suppliers of product to our stores for the 25,000 products that we sell in our stores. Sure, but some of your products, like how animals are being treated in that, you said in your testimony you guys go send inspectors out, so I thought maybe you'd go to PCA. Yes, we do, and, and um, I can com comment on that now to explain the difference for us is that um, we rely upon the government system and the good manufacturing practices. Well, did you ever check with the government on Texas? Because you were getting it from Plainview, Texas, and Texas wasn't even registered. So did you check with Texas or the FDA to see if the place was even on anyone's radar screen, registered with anyone to produce food? No, we did not. Mm. We um, re re try to rely upon the system in the United States we purposefully source our product from companies that manufacture in the United States because of the gold standard of manufacturing practices that do exist in this com country. Well, but what I was trying to say about the inspections for um, humane treatment of animals is when there is not a government system in place, we do go out of our way to make sure that we inspect that what is on those labels. Sure, but, but all due respect, uh, in this case, because you get yours from Plainview, Texas, you didn't even check to see if it was even registered, the operation. So even if, even if government was doing its job, if you would have checked it, you would have found that this Plainview, Texas place, which has all the dead rodents in it, wasn't even registered, was not never registered or inspected by Texas or the FDA. Let me ask this question. This is a 2000, June 2000 audit report from the Inspector General to the Health and Human Services, and I've been on this committee now 15 years. I'm sure Mr. Dingle and Mr. Waxman who have been on longer than this know how many years we've been trying to get standards. You all talked about all the things you're going to do now, and I compliment you on trying to do some things. But we can't have Kellogg's doing one thing, Mr. Ken doing something else, Ms. Isley, your company doing something else. Don't you think it's about time we have some standards as to what we look for when we go to these plants? We were baffled last time that the state inspectors didn't pick up some things in the Georgia plant that were structurally wrong that encouraged, not discouraged, cross-contamination. Don't you think it's about time we have either federal standards, international standards, since a lot of our food comes overseas, or at least CDC, NIH, some kind of standards that we all got to play by for inspections, testing of food in food processing place, uh, because you're all doing something different and they're not going to mesh. Congressman, I think one of the recommendations we made was that we actually develop consistent food manufacturer audit standards. Uh, yeah, number seven, yeah, that was sort of like your standard number seven, uh, but who should be in charge of that? You know, I think if, uh, if you start with the first recommendation we made, which was forming a single food safety authority uh, within HHS, and then having an advisory group that actually works for them on a scientific base, the reason for that is there are so many moving parts here 
uh, that we need to bring the science to bear. Industry can work with that group to ensure that we are looking at the right standards for, for varying sure. food facilities. It claims they've been doing that for years, way back to June of 2002, and never gets done. Well, Either industry or, or I, someone doesn't want to cooperate. I think we're all here to try and work with you to en encourage that you know we do move forward and make that change and we establish those standards and I think there are a number of things we need to do consistent with that. The other recommendation we have in here is that on high risk foods that the FDA actually does an annual audit and within the context of that annual audit that all of the testing done by that facility uh, is shared with the FDA when they go in and do that annual audit. Okay. Uh, it doesn't fix for this unfortunate situation, but it certainly should enhance the food safety in the U.S. going forward. Sure, I mean, a high risk. I mean, we did the same thing in 97, and now we, here we are again in uh, no, 2007. We had the one in Georgia, and here we are two years later, same thing. Uh, Mr. Walden, for questions, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm glad you raised that issue of the IG report. Mr. Barton and I sent a letter to the FDA last week. Uh, requesting documents and information on whether FDA has implemented the invest, uh, invest, uh, Inspector General's uh, recommendations and how the FDA is implementing them. And again, this goes back to June of 2000. So we, we've got some work to do on our end to make sure that the FDA is looking at these state uh, controls on, on inspections and, and what's happening out there when they do delegate it out. So I, I hope you'll uh, uh, help us in trying to get answers out of the FDA, Mr. Chairman, because I, I concur with, with your analysis on its, its lack of implementation. I've, I've got a couple of uh, just sort of yes and no questions for you initially and then, and then a couple that will go into a little more depth. Um, do you support uniform standards for third-party auditors, including standardized questions and formats and government um, accreditation of these third-party audit firms? Yes. 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 Thank you. Um, and should third, one of the things that's concerned me is, and, and it came out in some of the testimony today, um, when I was in the broadcast business, I was regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. The inspector chose when he or she was going to show up to look at my public file, go out and look at my tower, review my equipment, have my operator show they could do an uh, emergency alert test. Um, they didn't call ahead of time to say, a week from Thursday I'm going to come out. Do you support uh, third party uh, audits uh, being announced or unannounced? I support them being unannounced. Mr. Mackay? I think as long as the logistics can work, uh, for an unannounced because there are so many audits that are going to be conducted. Uh, at some point, maybe you've got to give at least a day's notice or some notice. Uh, but if it helps the system by just going in unannounced, then I, we would support that. Ms. Isley? We support unannounced. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your answers to those questions. They're, they're helpful. Um, did, did your company receive a certificate of analysis or some representation from PCA that the peanut products sold by Peanut Corporation of America to your company were safe? We have in the past, yes. Yes, on every batch we got in, we had a certificate of analysis and uh, all of them were negative. No, we did not. You did not, okay. And, and did you seek those certificates or? or not. We did not seek those certificates as a as a retailer. In You're more of a retailer. You're buying product to we're, resell. We're buying product to resell, and so it's we don't seek those certificate analysis on the food side. We we really try to work with the system that exists. Okay, Mr. McKay, I, I have before me in. Do you know what tab that is? In. I, I guess it's not in the document book. Uh, Mr. Chairman, without objection, I'd ask that this document be put in, in the record. It's one. That's a certificate of no, no objection. And, and this is the one um, dated July 12th of 07 from Peanut Corporation of America to Kellogg's regarding coarse natural peanut paste, lot number 7192 CN. P B is in boy, and under the microbiological data, it uh, it shows results as negative for Salmonella. My understanding is that um, this certificate um, says negative, and yet this was one of the lots that showed positive on on Salmonella. Do you? Uh, 
I you can't confirm on the lot, but I know that every uh, we went back and checked every certificate of analysis we'd received from PCA. Uh -huh. Every certificate of analysis was negative, and I think that that just highlights how extremely difficult it is when you've got an unethical and dishonest supplier to actually manage for this. And and do you think that the records that uh, from these independent labs that do the analysis to see if, if there's a, a problem with the product. Do you think those records, A, should be available upon inspection by the FDA? I, I think any finished food records uh, that show a positive, uh, it could be helpful to actually present those to the FDA. Seisley? We would agree with that. Yes. Canon. Because it, it, one of our hearings, it, it came out that I guess they have to go through the Bioterrorism Act in order to get access to these records. And that just seems preposterous to me. I, I don't understand it. Do you think these ought to be electronically reported to the FDA when there is a positive hit? That would be very helpful. Yeah, I think that would be the best uh, course. Yes, that would help and, us. And do you think that there ought to be uh, a requirement for this kind of testing to occur and for audits to occur? L let me understand your question again, Congressman, uh, a little bit fuller. Uh, you're asking, do you think that te mandatory testing should be required on what, ki what kind of testing? Salmonella? I, or you know, I'm not an expert in right. the field. I'd, I'd seek your counsel yeah, and I, others absolutely. that are in the biological field. I agree with you. I think that would be very helpful to have mandatory testing on requirements that somebody says sh should be, you know, peanut butter, salmonella, for example. You know, I, I would uh, clearly support if a lab finds a positive test on finished food, they, uh, they give that to the FDA. Um, one of the things that I think it's critical when you understand the, the system is that the prevention is really the key right. to, to very strong food safety. And it, to prevent, uh, environmental testing becomes one of the key uh, steps in that, which is done much further upstream. Most companies that do environmental test testing as we do in all of our facilities, uh, if we were to find any issue, we would take preventative action to prevent it actually and getting into the food stream. So the only reason I raise that, uh, Congressman, is the complexity uh, if you ask for every test, environmental as well as finished food, you potentially could overwhelm the system and the FDA and it may be impractical. Uh, I'm not trying that's to be fair. offensive, but it's... No, 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 that's, I'm, I'm seeking really, your input because right. we don't want to shut down the food chain. We want it to be safe. Yeah. And which you really lead into my next point, these, these very dramatic and disgusting photos that we have came about not from the third party auditors, is my understanding, and this is out of the Texas plant for PCA that show the, you know, the dead rodents and the feathers and God only knows what else. Um, this came about because of an inspection. And, and uh, excuse me, an investigation. And my understanding is that in your industry, when there's an audit, it's it's maybe a day long, and the company picks the auditor, and they can pre-announce that they're coming, and so they don't get into potentially into the detail level that an investigation that can sh that can go three or four days uh, might actually get into, and it was a, the result of an investigation that found this. So, uh, should audits be longer? Should they be more on the investigative side? With third-party audits, Congressman, they're at least a day or more at our facilities. Um, FDA is a couple hours, two or three hours. And that's FDA inspection. But what about investigation? Have you ever had one of those? A an actual investigation? Right. Not that I'm aware of. All right. Mr. McKay? No, I think it's uh, rather than uh, one of the differentials here is on inspections, um, I think uh, if you've got a high risk uh, facility or food ingredient, our recommendation, and we've already made this change internally, uh, is to have a multifunctional team. Uh, typically, they would take longer than a day, but even if it's a day, you've got three, four people versus one person, and you have experts in a variety of different areas, so they're actually doing as, as good a scan as possible. We've said uh, in one of the recommendations we've made, uh, that we believe that uh, food safety uh, plans should be developed for all facilities in the U.S. Now, now I have one more question. I, I appreciate the chairman's indulgence. Uh, Ms. Isley here is a retailer. Could be any store in America. If she came to your company, Mr. McKay, and said, "I need to 
see tests, I need to see all these things before I'll sell your product. How, how would that work? Is that even, do retailers come to you and demand that? Yes, they do. And sometimes retailers will demand a specific type of audit. And it, it, how do you respond if it's Walmart or a big chain, I'm not picking on Walmart, but, but a, a pretty big buyer with a lot of horsepower versus a small independent? But for if, us, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. Uh, within the context of our facilities, uh, we have standardized audits that uh, comply with almost every criteria that, that it, retailers would ask for. Is that, is that the same, Mr. Kanan, for you? Yeah, I mean, if a retailer came to us to ask us for our audit, it's all standardized, we would be able to give them. And you do that? Do retailers yeah. come to you and ask that on a regular basis? Some do. Okay. Many don't. So regardless of size, they could they could ask you for that. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Waxman, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mackay, you you indicated you had a certificate of analysis showing that there was no salmonella in the batch that you were buying from uh, the Peanut Corporation of America. Uh, as I understand, a certificate of analysis is no guarantee that there's no salmonella. It's it's they tested it, but it doesn't. And where they tested, there was no salmonella, but there could be in the tub some other place where there uh, might be salmonella. And it turned out to your misfortune that it was a, uh, an unscrupulous supplier that was providing this, uh, this batch of peanuts to you. But you indicated in your written statement that, um, that you, um, you say that there is an audit finding that reported no concern that the facility may have had any pathogen-related issues or any potential contamination. And I'm quoting from your written statement. I want to direct your attention to a March 2008 AIB audit report for PGA's Georgia facility. And uh, in this audit report, we know AIB is the, is the group that did the audit for uh, PCA. Uh, in this audit report, it says the following. This facility had evaluated the processes and procedures and determined that no critical control points were present in the operation. No critical control points. Now, what, that, that to me is when we talk about a, a HACCP, there has to be a plan. There has to be a plan for preventing salmonella. And they're saying there were no critical control points. Now, obvious critical control point would be the roaster because a roaster can kill the salmonella. Uh, so it, if most manufacturers would very much see the uh, peanut roasting stage a critical control point. But this audit said to you there were no control, con critical control points. Uh, this means PCA looked at its peanut manufacturing process, process, it looked at all of its procedures, and it determined they didn't have any critical control points, not even for killing salmonella. Uh, did you have a reaction when you saw that in the audit, or did you even notice it? Uh, don't you think that PCA should have designated killing salmonella at the roasting stage as a critical control point? Uh, firstly, I, I didn't see that particular audit. I think the audit that I referenced, uh, they, when we'd gone through as part of our multi-step process and looked at the third-party audit, um, and looked at what AIB had given us in that audit, that they had quantified that they did have a food safety plan in place. Um, so, and my belief is, and one of the recommendations here is, that we should codify that all plants should have a food safety plan in place, uh, because really that's the key. Well, we need to prevention. do that. Sorry? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. We need to do that for yeah. the future. But in this case, you were relying on PCA to, to have this third party audit. They had a third party auditor who, in my view, clearly had a conflict of interest. They wanted to give PCA an audit that PCA would like. In fact, they even gave PCA an award that they knew PCA would like, saying they were superior in their quality, even though we know for, uh, that's not the case. So um, if, if the audit was sent to you and said PCA didn't even have critical control points, that audit was telling you at Kellogg that PCA did not have a plan to effectively kill salmonella. You know, peanuts are high risk product for salmonella. So I, I, I'm sure you're aware and all of you are aware that there, that there needs to be a, 
a clear plan uh, to make sure that uh, salmonella is uh, stopped. And I, uh, I think that uh, PCA was a bad company. Uh, they did bad things, and they, uh, and they were uh, clearly um, uh, ignorant because they wanted to be ignorant. But this indicates to me that Kellogg was pretty sloppy. You were just taking things for granted that PCA was going to do the right thing. They gave you a report of a, uh, their inspector. They hired the cheapest inspector they could possibly get. I think they paid this inspector uh, maybe uh, uh, $1,500. There are uh, more thorough inspections. It would have cost more money. The gold standard is a $20,000 inspection. Well, I guess everyone should realize that it would, they would have been better off spending $20,000 than going on the cheap because it's $70 million, I believe, is the loss for all of this uh, as a result of their going on the, on, 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 the, on the faith that everything was going to be okay without making sure they could stop Salmonella and stop this sort of thing from happening. Do you think that you were sloppy? Congressman, I think we uh, did everything we could do. When we looked at our multi-step uh, process, uh, the third-party audit was a key part of it, but we did a risk as uh, analysis assessment. Uh, we did actually take the product in and check it through our labs, and then we relied on certificate of analysis. And as I mentioned, you know, managing for an unethical, dishonest supplier who is prepared to actually put people's lives at risk is something as we've stepped back and learned from this means that w we have already changed our process and that's why we're here trying to uh, work with you to say there are a number of things we believe we well, let me, need to do. Let me tell you, there were some red flags that you should have noticed. I think you should have noticed that statement in the audit that said they didn't have the critical points. You didn't do what Nestle did. You didn't send your own people to the plant to inspect it. You relied on uh, what what uh, ordinarily, I guess, would have been okay. But you didn't do that extra step that I, I hope will now require to make sure that there is a process to prevent salmonella. And in that regard, I, I, I must differ with you. I think Kellogg was sloppy. I think PCA was bad. And uh, I think the whole thing has resulted in a tragedy that uh, could have been prevented. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Dingle, for questions, please. Uh, we're just starting votes, but let's get some questions in. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the panel, I'm going to ask a series of questions that will require only a yes or a no answer. We will start with you, Mr. Cannon, and go across to uh, Mr. Mackey and then Ms. Isley. Uh, First, do your companies have best practices in place to ensure the safety of the products you receive from suppliers? Yes Ye or no? Yes. Do you, Mr. Mackey? Yes. Uh, Ms. Isley? Yes. All right. Uh, do these best practices include on-site audits of sanitary conditions and processing techniques of suppliers prior to and during your contractual relationship with them? Yes or no? No. Sometimes. Sometimes. Ms. Isley? Sometimes. Do I get to say uh, sometimes, Mr. Dingle? I thought it was a yes or no. I, I, yeah, I, I've got to do it that way because we have a very short amount of time. Did, um, ladies and gentlemen, again, did representatives from your companies inspect sanitary conditions and, and processing uh, practices of Peanut Company of America prior to your company contracting with that company as a supplier? Yes or no? I'm sorry, I have to hear your question again. Did representatives from your companies inspect sanitary conditions and processing techniques of Peanut Company of America prior to contracting with PCA as a supplier? Yes or no? No. We relied on industry practice. I'm sorry? We relied on industry practice. No. Okay. Uh, Ms. Isley? No. Uh, did uh, representatives from your companies inspect sanitary conditions and processing techniques of PCA while it was contracted as a supplier of peanut products to your companies? I'm just having a hard time hearing you. I'm hearing noise I'm over doing here. my best. 
Did representatives from your companies inspect sanitary conditions and processing techniques from PCA while it was contracted as a supplier of peanut products to your companies? We relied on industry standards as well, so no. Uh, Likewise, we relied on industry standards and certificate of analysis. Ms. Isley? We also relied upon industry standards, and no, we did not inspect. Now, prior to the outbreak of salmonella called by PCA's products, were your companies aware of the unsanitary conditions present in PCA's processing facilities? No. No, we were not. No, we are not informed. So what effect, what in effect you did was to rely on Food, uh, food and Drug Administration's inspections and on uh, industry practices to see to it essentially that you got safe products and you were taken advantage of. Is that not so? That is not so. We required specification sheets. We believe the FDA was inspecting it and they were doing their jobs. We required Mr. continuing pure food guarantees. So I'd Mr. have to Mackey. disagree with you on that. You know, I, I think as we've talked third party audits, certificates of analysis, we had an unethical and dishonest supplier. Um, I'm perfectly unclear as how you manage for someone who's prepared to put right. consumers at risk. Ms. Isley? Uh, Representative, uh, Mr. Dingle, was the question, did we feel that we were, were taken advantage of? Well, you were taken advantage of by a bunch of, by a bunch of sharpshooters who didn't do a decent job. Yes. And you relied on food and drug and you, and, and you relied on industry practices to see to it you were safe. We do I don't find fault in you in that. I think you're entitled to do it, but I think, you made, I think you found yourself in a bad position because the law did not provide you and the rest of, the, and the rest of industry and consumers the protections they needed. Now, uh, uh, would an up-to-date registry of all food facilities operating in the U.S. or importing food into the United States have helped FDA to identify and respond more quickly to the salmonella outbreak caused by PCA's project, products, yes or no? Sir, every time you speak, I seem to get interference. It was your question that required registration of facilities? Up-to-date registration yes, of all absolutely. facilities. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Mackey? All facilities should be registered. Ms. Isley? Yes. Now, I believe food processors should have to notify the FDA when they begin uh, producing products that they had not previously registered. Do you agree? In other words, that's a part of having an up-to-date registry of processors and the state of the processing that comes into your plants. The way I understand your question is I believe that every food facility should be registered at no matter in the country. And, and it ought to be registered for all the products that they ship. That's correct. Mr. Mackey? Well, I'm not sure the system actually exists, so I'm not sure you can rely it on it. It doesn't exist, doesn't and I'm exist, asking so. whether you think that that would be a protection to you. Well, at the moment, we wouldn't know whether a plant was registered or not because right. I don't think it's mandatory. Ms. Isley? Yes, we would support it because we believe it would support, it would help protect small businesses like ours, particularly if there was a way to communicate whether or not people were in compliance. Do you believe that Food and Drug has the resources and the ability to carry out its responsibilities in assuring that product reaching your places of business and arriving ultimately at the consumer's doorstep are safe? Yes or no? Do I believe they have the resources is the question? Yes. I think they have the resources. They just need to refocus themselves. The question themselves. is, do they have them? Yes. I believe I answered your question. I'm sorry? I believe I answered your question. I'd just like you to tell me yes or no. They have the resources to do the job or not? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. You think uh, they do? No, Mr. I Mackey? do not believe they do. I believe that's one of the I'm reasons sorry? why we... No, I do not believe they do. I think that's one of the reasons why we're here today. Ms. Isley? We do not believe that they have the resources necessary. Now, would better trace back capabilities uh, have helped to uh, FDA to mitigate or to prevent this salmonella outbreak? Yes. Mr. Mackey? It's a difficult one. I, I believe they could have. Okay. Ms. Isley? 
Yes. Now, should testing on food products and examination uh, and visits and investigation of plants uh, that are shipping products in interstate commerce be subject to safe uh, be subject to safety requirements and be performed only by a laboratory accredited by FDA. Yes or no? Yes. Yes or no? Yes, I believe labs should be accredited by the FDA. Ms. Eisley. Yes. Uh, could this crisis have been mitigated if testing laboratories had been required to send their testing results to FDA? No. Mr. Mackey? Uh, no, I think it's uh, impossible to manage for an unethical and dishonest supplier. Ms. Isley? It's difficult to answer the question. Right. I don't believe that it would unless there was some form of communication to businesses that may be in receipt of products that had tested positive. So you all three are of the view that FDA doesn't need to receive the results of the investigation and the testing of the, tes of the testing laboratories. Is that correct? No, that's not true because that was not your question. Okay. Uh, should FDA have the authority to issue mandatory recalls of tainted foods? Uh, Yes, but I have a comment on that, if I may. I, I don't have time. Mr. Mackey? Yes, I would fully support that. Ms. Isley? Yes, we support that. Now, uh, we've agreed that the companies do not, rather that the uh, food and drug does not have the resources to do the job. Uh, do, you, do your companies support or oppose mandating registration fees with which to fund increased inspections by FDA. Starting with you, Mr. Kanan. You're calling me here to answer, ask my opinions, and I don't feel like I I'm want able opinion. to. Yes. I don't. Am I here for your opinion or for a yes or a no answer? I just want to hear. I just want to hear. Do you agree that they should have or they should not have? So I'll have you ask me that question again. I'm sorry. I need to have that question again. Do your companies support or oppose mandating registration fees with which to fund increased inspections by FDA? We would not be opposed. Mr. Mackey? We would support uh, coming up with the appropriate way to improve the U.S. food safety system and finding a way to fund it, and I think industry would, uh, would support that. Uh, a lot more discussion would need to take place as to exactly what that might mean. Thank you. Ms. Isley? I think that we would be in support of it, and I agree with Mr. Mackey's comments that we, we have to investigate it, particularly to look at its impact on small businesses. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Thank Dingle. You, Mr. Mr. Gett, for questions? Thank you, Mr. We've got Chairman, uh, just, four minutes. If others want to go vote, I'll we'll just, try to um, hold it for a bit. I have a couple of questions because I can't back, come back, and I appreciate okay. your indulgence. I'd like to ask you, Mr. Kanan, do you support the nine principles that Mr. McKay said that we should uh, adopt to improve our food safety system in this country? Uh, from what I heard, Mr. Gett, we, I do support it very much. Thank you. Ms. Isley? Yes, we support that. And um, I want to ask both of you, I want to start with Mr. Kanan. Um, have, have the sales of your company suffered as a result of being tied to PCA? We haven't fully had a chance to analyze it yet. What about you, Ms. Isley? <laughs> I would say that we have not. We have been, the, the, the second that there was any possible association or problem, we immediately pulled the product because we were concerned for the health and welfare of our customers. Do you think your Do you think the confidence of your customers would be increased if we improved our all of these food safety standards that we've been talking about oh, today? What about you, Mr. Kanem? Yes, absolutely. What about you, Mr. McKay? Yeah, absolutely. I think anything we can do to strengthen confidence in the food safety system in the U.S. is uh, is is going to be worth doing. And um, let me start with you, Mr. Kanan. Now, now, we are hoping and we're intending to pass comprehensive food safety legislation this year. But barring that, you've got a financial interest in your company in improving, um, in, in improving the safety of the food that you receive. Are you doing that? Are we? Are, are, you, are you instituting practices that will improve 
the oversight of the of the yes that you're, we are and what about you miss isley yes we are can you can you delineate for me some of the specific things that you're doing um we, on the food side of our business we have started um a quality questionnaire that uh, that is in accordance with some of the um, grocery manufacturers associations, good manufacturing practices um, to do audits and make sure that, that any of our vendors are, are following those good manufacturing practices. We are also, particularly in, in respect to the peanut products, peanut uh, roasted peanuts that we receive, we are testing for salmonella and requiring a certificate of analysis that is free of salmonella. And, and uh, do you think you might expand that for other types of um, at-risk products? Yes. So. Now, now, you said you have how many suppliers? We have 1,300 suppliers. 1,300 suppliers. And what, are, what were your gross revenues last year? Our gross revenues last year were close to $200 million. $200 million. Now, do you have the financial ability to go out and inspect all of those 1,300 suppliers? No, we do not. And so what, um, what percentage of those do you think you can inspect? <laughs> what percentage of those? Yeah, because you said you're inspecting some meat suppliers and, and we, yes, we do. We 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 inspect um, our meat suppliers that make our animal suppliers for humane treatment of animals, cage free, um, range grass fed, um, access to pasture. Right, That's I understand that. Do you think it would be worthwhile for business reasons and also your consumers' health to expand that to inspections in some of the more at-risk areas like peanuts? We would like to see that in the food supply arena that the government systems that are that you're discussing putting in place that they work. If you're asking in the interim period, what is our intent? Yes, we intend to be more vigilant. I don't know what percentage we'll be able to visit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I Thanks, Mr. Gett. Uh, our time is up and uh, for votes too, so I guess we better hustle to the floor. We're in a recess for, for our, tell, how about 12.15? We got three votes on the floor. We should be back. Uh, we get back here at 12.15 promptly. We can uh, finish up this panel and finish up this hearing before the next series of votes. So we'll stand in recess till 12.15. Call the committee back to order. I guess we're okay. Uh, before questions from Ms. Sutton, let me just. Uh, Mr. Walden asked that we put this March 11, 2009 letter to uh, Frank Twardy, Acting Commissioner, concerning the uh, Salmonella outbreak uh, by Mr. Barton and Mr. Walden had signed it without objection be made part of record. Next, turn to Ms. Sutton for questions, please. Uh, Ms. Sutton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have several questions, but I would like to begin, Mr. Kane, and I know that uh, when you answered the question about supporting mandatory recall authority for the FDA that you wanted to say something in addition to uh, the fact that you all support that, so I'm going to give you this opportunity. Thank you, Congresswoman Sutton. And you know, I have a special uh, feeling for you because a lot of my employees live in your district, so you can imagine how much this has affected all of us. So thank you for that question. I do support a mandatory recall, but I wanted to express my at least concern or opinion that <clears throat> if there was a mandatory recall by the FDA, would it have prevented another manufacturer or owner of a company like myself from doing what I did and getting out three days in front of doing the recall on a presumptive positive on an open container of peanut butter? Would there have been another business owner like me that perhaps may have said, you know what, let's just wait for the FDA to do it? They'll get their results on Monday, 
it's their responsibility, and will, will everybody do that? Versus, now I don't think I would, I still would have done it, but I just, I'm wondering, and I just wanna ask this to, to you all, would that prevent anybody from doing an earlier recall? Thank you, Mr. Kane, and I appreciate that you answered that you, it would not have affected your decision to do it because that is what the responsible thing to do. Right. So Honest I appreciate you bringing up that uh, that point because it may mean that we have to do additional action to make sure that those who failed to do it just because the FDA has that authority, um, you know, maybe there's some more punishment yep. that needs to be put in place. Would you agree with that? Correct. Some more punishment I would. Yes. for the failure to do that. Um, I often hear in this committee um, and, and in related uh, hearings that one of the reasons that, that, that people are concerned about requiring test results to be reported to the FDA, uh, first of all, do you all agree that, that positive test results should have to be reported mandatorily to the FDA? Mr. Kanan? It sounds like that would be a very good idea, depending on the specifics. Okay, Mr. Mackay? So I'd agree, positive finished food testing should be reported to the FDA. And, and, and it should be mandatory that it is done. It's not just should be as in a voluntary nature, but in a, it should be mandatory that they have to report uh, positive results, correct? Yes, however it's done, I, I believe that finished food testing positive should be reported to the FDA. And it, it is also true today that it is a uh, law that if it's in commerce, you have to report it in any event, but I do support that. Well, well, I, I disagree with the, 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 uh, the assessment of what the status of the law is today and based on some other testimony here. And uh, Ms. Isley do, Isley, do you also agree that um, positive results need to be reported to the FDA and that we need to mandate that that is done? We absolutely agree with that. Our, our desire is that somehow that gets communicated so that small businesses like ours can make decisions based on those tests and can, can have the information that they need to make the decisions what vendors they buy from. Okay. And the reason why I even bring up that subject, it's actually related to my first uh, point with Mr. Kanan, is that I often hear from, from people in these hearings that we can't require the reporting of testing to the FDA because for fear that people then won't test. And I guess my response to that, sort of similar to the whole mandatory recall authority is, then we need to take further action to make sure that they are required to test and provide some sort of accountability for their failure to do so. So, um, you know, this is a big conundrum. And, and Mr. McKay, if I could just shift a little bit over to you, um, because I'm struck by some of the, the testimony that you have given here. Um, you talked about that high-risk foods, it's your belief that the FDA should do an annual audit. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. And you also testified that sometimes you do your own independent audit at Kellogg, and sometimes you do not because you have so many products. And, and is that correct? Was that your testimony? Uh, w within the context of our own facilities, we do uh, uh, environmental tests and we have a food safety plan across all of them. I was referring to when we talk about uh, ingredients or suppliers, right. given that we're th there are 3,000 uh, of those, uh, we have relied on uh, industry practice of third parties in a multi-step process. Okay, but I'm just asking you the, the question then. So you said that sometimes you do a third party independent audit. Sometimes though you you send out someone from Kellogg, correct? To That's do the correct, audit? Yes. Okay. And you, you think that the FDA should be responsible for doing the high risk audits, but why don't you think that it would be a good practice for Kellogg, because peanuts obviously high risk product, yep. for Kellogg to also make that their standard that if you're dealing with a high risk ingredient, that you wouldn't do your own audit. Yeah, Congresswoman, it's, it's, it's really a practicality difference. Uh, for example, we have, we have undertaken audits of all of the peanut and peanut paste suppliers uh, going forward, um, and so have almost every other company that uses peanut-based products. The implication has been that those companies are running so many audits for companies, they actually can't produce the product we all want. So if we could get great standards, if we could have an FDA system where on high risk plants they're actually doing an, an inspection that we can all rely on, uh, it, it would be better for everyone because then they can actually, these, these audits, the comprehensive ones, can take a, a fair amount of time um, and rather than duplicate those by hundreds or thousands of companies, uh, if there's a set standard and uh, an FDA audit of high risk facilities, uh, we should, 
I believe, be able to rely on that. Okay, I would also just like to talk a little bit about that third par party audit that, um, and you, you made a reference to the entity that conducted that third par party audit. And is that, an, is that a, an entity that you use a lot? Uh, if you're referring to AIB, yes. um, I think AIB uh, and third party audits in general are, are broad across the industry. I think AIB is probably the largest auditor in the US. My question is, do you use them a lot? Uh, I can't tell you exactly uh, how many audits we use from them, but we would use them on a number of our uh, raw material supplies, yes. Would you please provide that information to me after the hearing when you sure, get I'm sure uh, we can further get information? That, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and in light of all of the things that have happened, are you still relying on AIB audits after all of the information that's been presented here today and in the past few months that has come out? Are you still relying on AIB audits? You know, if you look at the AIB audit, they actually did find the problems. Uh, the issue wasn't with the AIB audit. It was with the fact that uh, PCA actually acted in a dishonest uh, and unethical way. Uh, the audit by AOB identified the problems uh, and PCA did not act upon them. Well, Mr. Mackay, I would suggest that, that, that some of the evidence that's, or the information that's been presented here today um, creates great concern about the coziness of these third party uh, so-called independent audits and, and, and the results. And so part of my, con my, my question again was just whether or not you continue to rely on the audits by AIB. Well, subsequent to this uh, unfortunate uh, event, we have undertaken with high risk suppliers to conduct our own audits. Thank you. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Braley for questions, please. Mr. Chairman, I want to focus on the costs of inadequate food safety inspections. And I'll start with you, Mr. Mackay. There are press reports that the peanut industry could lose as much as a billion dollars as a result of this salmonella outbreak. And that's a lot of money. But what strikes me is how little money it would have taken to prevent all this from happening. We know that the inspections didn't work when they were conducted by AIB, the third party auditor that PCA hired. And when committee staff interviewed AIB officials, they told us that those audits were standard good manufacturing practices audits, which are the firm's most basic audits that cost about $1,000. But AIB also told the committee staff that they offer more rigorous audits, which they call the gold standard audit, that is much more intensive and costs in the range of twenty to thirty thousand dollars. So, Mr. Kanan, let me start with you. Did your firm ever consider acquiring a gold standard audit from AIB? Uh, we uh, every year have done uh, our AIB with the good manufacturing practices one, and uh, we have not. Uh, nor did I actually know about this gold standard twenty thousand dollar audit. Mr. Mackay, has Kellogg ever used a gold standard audit from AIB? Uh, I can't, I don't know whether we have. I can tell you that uh, within the context of our own facilities, uh, we are doing what you'd term gold standard audits. Um, Ms. Isley, has your firm ever used a gold standard audit from AIB? Mr. Bailey, um, I appreciate the question. We are a very small retail Can business. Can you just answer the question, please? I don't have much time. No, we did not. All right. Another option that was available to all of you, and I think you alluded to this, Mr. Mackay, is paying your own audit staff to conduct an audit. And earlier in the hearing, we learned that another company, Nestle USA, did its own audit of PCA rather than using a third party auditor hired by PCA. Nestle's audits uncovered serious defi deficiencies such as rodent infestation and inadequate pathogen monitoring, and as a result, they refused to do business with PCA. Do any of you know how much Nestle paid to conduct its own audit of PCA? No. Just answer yes or no. no. No, but I would reflect that that audit was done in 2002, and audits by default are at a point in time inspections. Well, we all know that things go up over time because of inflation, but we're talking about a billion dollar impact on one segment of the food industry. And, and the numbers we're talking about in the thousand dollar range seem fairly small by comparison. Well, we asked Nestle, and here's what they said. They told us that they pay cost to their audits that they conduct 
and counting the employees' salaries, travel expenses, and other costs, they estimated that their audits of PCA cost $1,800, which seems like nothing compared to the alternative. And both of those audits took one day to conduct. Um, Mr. McKay, can you tell us, based on current figures, how much Kellogg calculates that this problem has cost it? Uh, currently, our estimation is between 65 and 70 million dollars. Mr. Cannon, do you have any estimate of what this has cost your company? It's around uh, half a million dollars. Ms. Isley, we do not have an estimate. So, for a Approximately $1,800, each of your businesses might have discovered the disastrous conditions at PCA and avoided the millions of dollars in recall costs and lost sales that you were incurring today, which seems like a very small investment in food safety up front and part of smart business practices. So let me ask you this. Mr. McKay, does your company, McKay, does your company have plans to change its auditing practices going forward? Uh, we have already changed uh, as a learning from this with high risk ingredients when we are conducting uh, our own audits. Uh, Mr. Kanan, what about your company? Yes, we have already changed as well. We, we want to do more audits and we want, because of this situation that happened with our high risk suppliers, which we have determined. Ms. Isley? Yes, we have plans in place to change. Once again, we are a small retail chain where you say $1,800 is a small amount of money and it is not for a business of our size. Well. You also I, realize I, that one of the costs. I agree costs that one of the, the, the primary issues for us is to ensure the health and safety of the people who buy food from us, and that is our primary concern. But I also want to give input into the committee that is realistic when you are talking about small chain retailers and what they can and cannot do, because it would be a disservice to the committee to say that we will go to to the point where we would be out of business in order to inspect the 1,300 vendors. Well, let's, let's that talk about that. You, your company has $200 million in gross revenues, operates 30 stores in three states, and employs approximately 1,000 people. Do you think it is worthwhile to risk the employment of those 1,000 employees by failing to take adequate safeguards up front and having the long-term costs risk bankruptcy for the company? No, we do not. But at the same time, if we well, I want to reclaim my time because inspect. I don't have any time left. I want to just close, Mr. Chairman, by pointing out that one of the reasons that I founded the Populist Caucus was to emphasize consumer protection and corporate responsibility. And I think it's important at this hearing to acknowledge that we need to reward companies like Nestle USA who do the right thing and to set best corporate practices. They operate a facility in my district in Waverly, Iowa, and I would like the record to reflect that they are a good example of what you do when you do things right. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Ms. Schakowsky for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I, I want to acknowledge that I think we are at the base of this problem. We are talking about a company that, as far as I am concerned, was headed by a murderer. Um, somebody who um, knew that there was a problem and, and quite deliberately made a decision to send that product out. Um, I don't know, Mr. McKay, McKay, if you've been here before. I know the other two for sure haven't. And, but we have. We've been here before with food that has, um, if not killed, definitely made a lot of people ill. Spinach. And peppers, and you know, we've every so often we're, we're here again, and so I, I just want to acknowledge the responsibility that I feel as a member of Congress and our responsibility to to act. Um, but I also do want to take you up on what I've heard of your offer, and I'm not, uh, uh, you know, none of us is absolved of you know some responsibility, and certainly going forward we have to be. Um, and uh, I, I did want to, because we, we had a, a private conversation, Mr. Cannon, and, and I do want you uh, to tell me about that conversation with Mr. Parnell at, at PCA. Um, yeah, uh, it was, uh, I just wanted to clarify that. And uh, Mr. Stupak, you had in your opening statement that, um, that uh, I, I had said in my opening statement that I personally talked to, to Mr. Parnell and I had asked him when, we're hearing rumors of salmonella. When the Minnesota Department of Agriculture called me, we're hearing rumors. They're testing it, and I want to know. I want to know from you: Have you had any other problems with salmonella? Have you? 
had any other complaints? Have you had any problems in the past? And he personally told me on the phone, no. The email you showed is actually four or five hours after that. That's when we started talking to him. And we said, um, that's when you hear the, about, well, we're, we're going to have to do the recall. And that's when he said, I think I'm going to go to church and pray. So we were very up on top of this with him. But when you have a, someone that's going to act illegal and criminal, I still am just so surprised and I don't know, bewildered on how to handle somebody like that in well, life. Well, let, let me just say, that's why I think we absolutely have to have the um, systems in place, both uh, at the uh, FDA, but I want to talk to you about systems as, as well. Um, you, do you think that as part of your own company's uh, reporting to you, that you ask for any positive test results from your suppliers? Let me just ask uh, each of you if that is a, uh, a feasible thing to, to do going forward, Mr. Kanan. Yes, that's feasible to do. And do, do you, uh, well, let me just get that, Mr. Mackay. Certainly anyone who provides us with raw materials, uh, they would uh, normally, if they're being honest and ethical, give us uh, a response via the third party lab uh, of a positive. Do you, do you request that? Is that routine? And do, we, do you plan to do that? We request that as uh, part of the certificate of analysis, yes. You do? Yes, it would be feasible to request it um, without the weight of law behind it. it can, and in a company that is bent on malfeasance, those can be... Um, not given or that they can also um, be fabricated. If they're not given, would you not feel that maybe this is not a company to deal, do business with? I think what I was referring to is, is I, I believe the question you asked is, should they be sending you the, the if they were positive? Should you, actually, I'm asking, should you be asking for that? Yeah. Yes, we can ask. We we do. We did ask for for their test results from Plainview Texas plant, and and yes, we do request that. Uh, my point was that our requesting it does not mean that they will necessarily provide us with the information if they have it, because there's no weight of law behind it. And additionally, if a company is bent on malfeasance, that they can fabricate the test result and show you a negative result. If, if I may, I, I don't mean to interrupt here, but Sorry. Ms. Isley, you're under oath, and, and you testified earlier. You never even asked for certificate of analysis. We so how can you say you asked those questions at Ms. Shahelsky? Mr. Chairman, we asked it after when we were talking to the Plainview, Texas plant. After the recall. After the recall, oh, yes, sir. Not before. No. He was asking about before. I, I was. Oh, I, I that, it be part, that, that, that it be part of your routine inquiry as uh, business owners to ask for the test results in a certificate of analysis. And, and can I just be clear, because we, we get that on the certificate of analysis. We have not, I don't believe, currently requested if a supplier we're dealing with had any positives, that they inform us of those, even whether they're for us or someone else. And I think earlier there was a question, should that be mandated to be given to the FDA? Uh, and I would support that. No, I'm not talking about the FDA now. No, no, I'm with you. Uh, I just think I, I may have not answered the question appropriately. So well, let me understand then. You did ask for that information or we, you did we, not? We ask for the information on anything that's sent to us. We, I don't believe we've asked for it more broadly to say if any supplier that we deal with had a positive for anyone else, uh, I would have to check that information. So in other words, anything we get that's coming to a Kellogg facility, we have a certificate of analysis and we get that information. Now, in the case of PCA, it appears that they may have uh, manipulated that information, but I would have to check whether or not we asked for it if it's for someone else and just happens to be a positive. Um, did you ask for PCA to disclose positive results before the outbreak? Had you ever asked them previous positives? Uh, as part of the independent third party audit and the risk analysis that we go through with the supplier, Yes. Uh, that's all part of the questioning, um, and typically the third party uh, will, uh, auditor will actually do that sort of a, evaluation. Um, and in fact, I think uh, AIB uh, did identify some issues and uh, 
I think the issue really at the end of the day was PCA did not take the corrective actions. And you didn't make sure that they did? Um, I, I, I believe we did everything we could, but you know, I'm, I, I may be getting into an area where I don't have actually the clarity of data here. Okay. I know I'm over time. I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, for questions, please. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel for being here. And this question is for Mr. Cannon and Mr. Mackay, and I guess all, all panelists. Um, have you heard of the Global Food Safety Initiative and the audits required to be GFSI certified? GSFI audits do analyze HACCP plans in greater depth, require a greater length of time to complete, are more expansive, and give a more accurate evaluation of a company's food safety controls. Would you be willing to, one, be subject to a GFSI audit, and two, require them for suppliers of high-risk ingredients? I guess we'll just go. I, uh, <clears throat> Congressman Sullivan, I've, he I've heard of it. I don't know the details much about it. I would most like, most willingly want to look at it and be a part of it. And as long as it's something that we could, would be feasible for us, we absolutely would, would be a part of it. And if it was something feasible for our suppliers, we absolutely would like to be able to request that of our suppliers as well. Be great. Yeah, Congressman, uh, absolutely. It started in 2000, uh, and we have been using that in all of our plants uh, and manufacturing facilities for about uh, three years. Um, as you look at it, there are three reasons why we think GFSI is a, is a great standard, and whether we adopt that for the U.S. food safety system or something equivalent, uh, we think it's a great benchmark. The standards are accredited, the audit firms are accredited, the auditors are certified, um, and, and it's just a much more rigorous process. Um, and I think there is a lot of discussion now with industry even talking about how we take GFSI and potentially use it in areas like APEC. So uh, I think that would be a, an excellent place uh, for this committee to look um, because it actually does address many of the recommendations I said and they're already in place uh, and formalized. Thank you. We are unfamiliar with the, the document that you are referring to. We'd be happy to take a look at it. Um, as a retailer and not a manufacturer, I'm not sure if we would have the expertise to understand mm -hmm. exactly all the requirements in it. Okay. All right, I got one more. Uh, the food production chain is very uh, complicated and there are many players, <coughs> uh, including suppliers, uh, processors, distributors, and retailers. Uh, should they have, a, have different responsibilities and controls for ins ins ensuring food safety? Yes, I, I believe they all should have different responsibilities and different levels of it, but my personal belief is it should start with the manufacturer, the one who is actually making the product, sealing it, boxing it, casing it. Um, that's where I think the emphasis needs to be, is on that portion of it. Um, I think there are things distributors can do and retailers can do in the supply chain to help, but it, the, the greatest emphasis has got to come on with the manufacturer of the product. I think the standards for uh, manufacturers and suppliers should be uniform and consistent, um, and that's the only way we're going to ensure the safety of the, the food supply. Uh, when you talk to retailers and distributors, I think that's a different situation there. I think the focus from their perspective is more on uh, traceability and how quickly they can react if there is a problem in the food system. But I think with the standards, uh, good manufacturing practices, uh, HACCP, et cetera, uh, that really comes back to suppliers and manufacturers. We would agree with all the statements that have been made. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, we'll go second round for those members who are here. Because uh, uh, a couple questions I want to follow up on. Uh, Mr. Cannon, you mentioned the um, email that I did in my um, opening statement, and 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 when they, Mr. Pennell wrote back, says it's I'm sure it's something we did. Haven't heard anything yet, but we'll let you know. Did they ever get back with you? Well, that's 
I mean, after that, that's when we we said we're doing the recall, and then we had to talk to them the next day and right. over the weekend, and it was a constant. Right, and I realize you're the first company to start right. the recall on the peanut butter, but did you notify the FDA then when, when you got this email? Oh, well, the FDA had already been a part of this, this whole process for the, the day. I can't remember the day of that email, if that's the fi Friday. Uh, January 7th, Wednesday, January 7th. That's the Wednesday, yeah. That was upon the first. So, um, you know, I right, don't... Right, but did you ever give them the email? I don't know if we did or not, to be honest with you, sir. Okay. Uh, you said you do independent testing now for food safety? Uh, you do testing now of the, your peanut butter and that? Well, well oh, yes, we are... Um, doing for the, the new peanut butter suppliers we're requiring a whole new set of standards for that as well um, okay but do you do testing over and above what what your new suppliers give you um, if we have I don't know I don't I do not know how to if we have tested the peanut butter for salmonella again or not but we so are, you could be basically in the, in the same position you're in right now well no hopefully not no two years me, from now like we have been but <laughs> But why, why wouldn't you? If you're not doing independent testing, why, why wouldn't you just end up in the same situation if you're relying on third parties? Well, no, I mean, we, we are, um, I, I want to make sure I'm answering you correctly. Sure. So you have to just bear with me just for a moment. A little uh, bit. I can't give you a <laughs> lot of time because we're five minutes. We, we are doing our own testing and we're doing, uh, we're, we're reevaluating the suppliers. We're looking at their AIB audits closely. You're doing your own testing. So you deal with peanut butter. The, the problem is salmonella. Do you test independently from your supplier for salmonella? I don't know if we have yet or not. Okay. So technically we could be back to where we were two years from now. Hopefully not, but we could be underneath this scenario. If, if, you're, if your company comes across and you're independent testing, if you come across with a positive for salmonella, You've indicated PCA should have notified the FDA. How about your company? Should you then be responsible oh, yes. for notifying the absolutely. FDA? Absolutely, and we absolutely would. How about you, Mr. McKay? You do the independent testing now. If, if you found positive tests for salmonella or E. coli on spinach, whatever it might yeah. be, do you think the company has a responsibility to notify the FDA? Yes, I believe so. We, we have started as a learning from this on all high-risk ingredients, doing our own uh, uh, multitask sure. uh, audits. Um, but yes, uh, I would agree that if you find uh, in the finished food a positive test, uh, the FDA should be notified. How about you, Ms. Isley? I beg your pardon? I asked Ms. Isley, same question. Oh, sorry. Yes, we have started we, our own testing on the roasted peanuts, and we believe that if there was a positive test, we would notif you should notify the FDA. Okay. Um, in, in this PCA thing, it's my understanding and reading your testimony that, that none of you hired PCA, or uh, I'm sorry, you hired PCA, but you didn't hire AIB. Is that correct, Mr. Cannon? You didn't. Well, hire we hire AIB for our own facilities. Okay. So how about for Georgia? We, we, as far as requiring our supplier to have somebody, right? I mean, we ask for their third-party audits. So you don't Not say a, use AIB or use. No, we don't specify currently who to use. Okay, how, Mr. Kai, how about you? I think there are three or four uh, auditors that we would be comfortable uh, with companies and suppliers using, and AIB was one of them, and probably the most And white. PCA picked them then? PCA picked them, yes. So they, they worked for PCA, they did not work for us. Okay. Are you still comfortable using AIB? You know, I think as we've looked at AIB, uh, they actually identified the problems. That the issue here is an unethical uh, and dishonest uh, company that actually ignored uh, many of the findings that AIB highlighted to them. Sure. But also here, my understanding from listening to your testimony was there were different things like you ask AIB to do a GMP, good manufacturing practices, but you could ask them to dig deeper as I think Mr. Braley and others pointed out, it would have cost more money, right? It would cost a higher test, like $20,000, to do a salmonella testing as opposed to just, just good manufacturing practices, correct? Yeah. Well, one of the learnings, I think, from this, from our perspective, is that uh, with high-risk uh, ingredients, then we are now doing our own uh, internal and more significant tests, which are more consistent with GFSI. But before, before the salmonella outbreak, you could have asked PCA to or AIB to do a more extensive testing for salmonella? We could have, and I think 
you know, I'd say that what we, we thought at the time we were using industry best practice. Uh, we have a multi-step process, including the third party right. audit and the C of A right. and a risk analysis. Uh, sure, but, but Georgia plants. Yeah. In 2007, ConAgra, was it Peter Pan or Skippy Peanut Butter, whatever it was, right. we had the same thing two years earlier. W wouldn't that have put you on an alert to uh, ask for a more robust testing, not just of what there's going on the line, but actually to test results and, and do testing for salmonella? I mean, this is all in the same spot. Basically, 18 months later, we have the same thing. Yeah, well, it was our understanding through the AIB audit that they were doing environmental testing. And, and when you look at ConAgra, Environmental testing was really the key there because the issue was the leak in the roof. Testing is different than food safety testing, is it not? Uh, they're a combination. Environmental testing is something you do at the start of the process to try and mitigate against anything actually making it into the food. Food, sure. And the final check is you have a certificate of analysis on the final food to make sure there is no pathogen in the food before it's shipped to us. So it's a combination of both of those things uh, that if they had been followed appropriately, we believe would have potentially mitigated against this. I, I guess the part that bothers me, Kellogg's, you're, you're a big, big corporation. Uh, many products that unfortunately cost you a lot of money because of this recall. But yet you put PCA in the driving driver's seat. You tell them, oh, use any one of these people. Uh, we rely on you, you don't do independent testing, but without you, there is no PCA. I mean, you're the guy who, you're the company that is the monetary giant here. You could control these suppliers better if you wanted to, because if you're not buying their product, it's gonna be harder for them to stay in business. I would think that a large corporation like yourself, you're all big corporations actually, uh, you would have more could have used your financial leverage to make sure some of these things we see now in hindsight uh, could have been done to prevent the salmonella, especially since we had peanut butter salmonella not even two years earlier. Yeah, I'm I, baffled by that. I think with hindsight, you're right, and we have changed our process, and we are doing our own testing. I, I mentioned earlier a, a potential practicality issue here when you look at the size of this supplier in the context of Kellogg. Uh, we bought, I think, five to ten million dollars annually of product from this company. Uh, we probably spend in excess of, I think, three or four billion dollars uh, on raw materials. So it was a very small supplier and the industry best practice is to use third party audits. We did supplement that with a risk analysis uh, and we did mandate certificates of analysis. And unfortunately, uh, a company that is not honest and ethical uh, can mitigate against even the best systems. Yeah, but uh, a question where it's in this industry standard when Nestle goes through and finds the problems, even Mrs. Fields cookies, uh, we have documents in, in, in our binder there that they found it. And another even smaller company went to PCA and just said, man, these are bad practices. We're not going to use them. Yeah. So I hope that's not the industry standards. I'm not trying to be defensive. Yeah, no, there are hundreds of companies involved here, so all of us, if you like, are partially at fault for potentially relying on a system that, that I'm hoping that, that Congress will work with industry to actually enhance and improve because that's the way we're going to actually make our food system stronger. Well, um, President Obama has put more money or proposed more money for, for the Food and Drug Administration, about a billion dollars more, about 200 million new money for food safety. But everyone tells us it's still not enough. They say they need at least $350 million per year for the next three years, plus about an 18 percent increase every year after that for another five years to get up to par for food and drug safety. And that's why we have the global food uh, safety bill that Mr. Dingle, Mr. Plo, and myself have written. Would you be in favor then of those registration fees? Not only do you have to register a plant like PCA, whether you're in Plainview, Texas, or in Georgia, but a registration fee and, and, and be put on these companies so we can finance uh, this rigorous inspection system we're all hoping for and wishing for so we stop the foodborne illnesses? Yeah, I think what I'd say is Kellogg, uh, food safety is paramount to Kellogg and I think to all, you know, reputable food companies and, and I think the industry would embrace how do we play an active role in ensuring that we can help in whatever the funding dynamics are to ensure that we do enhance the food safety system. I don't know exactly what that might mean. Um, but I know that, that uh, the industry would, and Kurt Kellogg would certainly 
uh, be prepared to step up to Including the, registration or inspection fees? Wh whatever the, the final determination might be, whatever makes most sense. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Walden for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McKay, let me go to you. How many suppliers does Kellogg's have? We have about, uh, I think, 3,000 ingredients, about 1,000 suppliers. 1,000 suppliers, 3,000 ingredients. And you require um, inspections, audits from all of those suppliers? Yes, we have a multi-step process that we use in actually accrediting every supplier, including a third-party audit, um, including a, uh, a, an analysis of risk, um, including certificates of analysis. Um, and have you worked with AIB? Are, are they, aren't, they're, on, they're one of them, I think you said, that is one of the gold standards, right? Well, they are, they are one of three or four, um, as I understand it, uh, accredited uh, auditing firms in the U.S. that we have on our list as being acceptable to use by uh, suppliers to do the independent third-party audits. All right. Um, Chairman Waxman stated that, that Kellogg's relied on procedures that are normally okay and did not in this instance take extra steps that he felt was necessary to catch or personally inspect PCA. Um, is it practical or cost effective to, to uh, take these extra steps? I think that's one of the things I'm, I'm struggling is where in the food chain do, literally do you, is it most effective? To, to step in. And I, I'm trying to figure, I've got a little company, well, i got a number of them in my district and state that have been affected. They're food producers. They've had to do the recalls. I, I think of the one out in Union, Oregon, uh, Rock Creek Nut that, you know, used some nuts and put it both in trail mix and in chocolate clusters. I cannot imagine a company in that tiny little town having the resources to go order inspections at PCA. How do we get to the point where if, if you're the one producing the next step in the product development that you can count on what you get to be safe. Yeah, I think I'd refer, you know, as I'm looking at the nine recommendations right. we made, uh, and each one of them actually builds on the other, so it's not like you can draw on one. Um, but I think if I pointed to the development of food safety plans for every food facility as being mandatory, developing right. consistent manufacturer audit standards as being another, uh, actually having the FDA inspect what they would determine yeah. through uh, the council as high risk foods and or uh, ingredients, um, mandating that when they do those annual inspections that if there are any test results uh, within that facility, they're turned over to the FDA. I'm talking environmental now, uh, more than finished food. Um, I think in combination, all of those things, plus mandatory recall and traceability, are going to be required to actually improve the food safety system in the U.S. Because I, I, I'm a little sympathetic toward Ms. Isley here, because as a retailer, I, I think it's it'd be almost impossible. It's bad. Enough, it's hard enough running your retail outlet than to think that every product you get in, you have to test. Or, or something like that, somewhere upstream of that, yes. she should be able to know that when it comes to her store from your company or your company that it's, it's safe. Otherwise, you go next, what, to the parents that you have to test it before you eat it. Uh, I mean, at some point here it gets ridiculous. You know, Congressman, I agree, and that's why I think we need a comprehensive overhaul of the, the current system, and I think the steps we've uh, put forward, and I know a number of these have already been in uh, what Congress is trying to pass, um, I think will make a significant difference in food safety in the U.S. So what stage in the production process would you say is most important? Which one has the greatest likelihood of, of detecting a problem? I mean, if we had to focus on here are the top two places you need to go, what's the order? Well, I think you've got to break it down. The, the first one is if we're buying ingredients, then you need a comprehensive system that ensures that those ingredients, when they come into our plant, uh, are actually safe. Um, now, typically the last step on that is a certificate of analysis. Uh, in this case, we had... Yeah, you uh, had one that we was... We had those, but, uh, you know, it's very hard to manage for an unethical company. Right. Once we have the raw material in assuming that it is safe, um, then within the manufacturing process, environmental testing at the very beginning of that uh, and all the way through, through food safety plans, whether it's HACCP or an equivalent, uh, is absolutely essential because if you detect something early on, you can avoid it getting into the finished right. food. That's absolutely critical. That's why companies do, and uh, 
GFSI, uh, these audits are, are so important, but once you have uh, the plant running, checking for environmental is, is really critical to make sure you can rectify any issues that might happen. And I have a, a, a question for, for both you and Mr. Kanan. You tested your products that you got from PCA, the ingredients of which came from PCA at some point after this was known, right? We, we relied on third the recall party product. audit. Oh, on the recall products? Yeah. Um, I think uh, the FDA has done all sorts of tests. In the facility where the sandwich crackers were made, uh, Carrie, uh, for example, we did over in the last year over 300 plus independent environmental tests, all negative. Uh, the FDA has come and did a massive amount of tests, all negative. All right, and, and, and Mr. Koenig. All the testing we did, Congressman Walden, on that turned up negative. But the interesting thing I'd like to talk about real quick is that when that open container was tested, they took 13 scoops of peanut butter and tested each one differently, and only four of the 13 turned up positive. All of the products that we tested were negative. I never heard what FDA found out about. Well, did but, you ask? But yes, but they and, just and they won't reveal back. it or what? They just haven't gotten back with us. Why? Well, I don't know. You don't know the answer to that. Well, and, and the <laughs> other question that, that I wanted to get to, and uh, then I'll let you finish up, because I'll forget it otherwise. You said in your testimony that on uh, you first, when you first got wind that there was a problem, right. that you asked FDA to test the product, yes. and they didn't. Why? Did they tell you? I was baffled at that on the first day. I don't know what their procedures or policies are. I. I, I was asking them, please take it and test it sure. because I want to know. Sure. If not, I'm going to do it anyway. So Did they say that's your responsibility, not ours? Was no, they that just kind of an answer. They didn't have an answer. But then they came back once. They, they came back the next day, and then they were maybe they didn't have a, weren't instructed by their superiors at that point, or I don't know. It didn't make sense to me, but I wasn't going to you know be questioning them at that point. But Mr. It. Chairman, it'd be a good follow-up, I think, for some time with the FDA as to why they didn't do that. I mean, I would think if you're a distributor or a producer and you think you've got a problem, yeah, being that's the FDA to say. And that we're the distributor, we obviously had the product right there, so it was. But then the next day, didn't they come back and take? The next day they came but back. But only after, right? Only yeah. after they discovered it in another container, right, or something like that. I, I don't know why they didn't why they didn't take it the first day versus yeah. the second day. Yeah, did they the took, second day, but not the first day. I, I know it was in your testimony. Yeah, I, right. Right. I don't know. But did, then he did you ever find out the results of those? No. He never did. That's the other issue. He hasn't been able to get the results back from the FDA, which seems odd. But it's going to be interesting because most of that was negative, and I think it's, that's what the thing about salmonella and finding that yeah. peanut butter. Sure, it peanut lives butter. in pockets. Yeah. And that's what we've learned. And that's why I think so many of us were so offended when PCA got a positive then they sent another sample out, got a negative, and then said, cut them loose right. about See, the lots. Somebody earlier had said that PCA was ignorant. I think no, no, no. they were very smart, and they knew exactly what they were doing to try and get around the system. They knew that they could probably reblend that peanut butter and retest it because, look, four out of the 13 right. only came back. The odds are you're going to get a negative. Yeah, that's a, one of the great things of this committee. You learn a lot about things you never thought you would learn about, and that's one of them, is that, that, that it is almost random in peanut butter whether you get a positive or negative sample. But that's why the law says you get a positive sample, you're done. Right. Now, you can go sample again and try and figure out what went wrong and where it's in the system, but you do not ship that. And we had the email that indicated they, yeah. at least from my reading of it, knew pretty clearly um, what they were doing and shipped out peanut butter once they got a negative after they gotten a positive and that's absolutely So to wrong. Mr. Mackay's point, how do you stop somebody from being yeah, that's, crooked? And, and I guess that's, and then I'll, I'll, I'll quit here because I've gone over my time, but I, that's what I'm struggling with is I don't want us to overreact and, and, and regulate to the point where you can't produce food and then what do we do, just have it all imported and we'll have no idea what's in it. Um, we, we know about that from our other hearings. Um, and, and so I want to I get a balance here that works, that gives us as much security as we can in our food chain, but doesn't blow up our whole system, because it's, it's, it's been working pretty well, frankly. I, I realize there are these issues we've, we've dealt with, and that's where we're trying to, I think we ought to hone in, be careful. Your recommendations, Mr. McKay, are most helpful, and, and all of your input has been most helpful for me. Is we've got a separate bill that's bipartisan that would address this, I, I think, in a, in a constructive way, too, and hopefully we can get together on, on a common strategy here. So thank you, Mr. Chairman.
and thank you to our witnesses. Well, thanks. I guess one thing, how do you get to it? I think there's a responsibility of, of uh, food processors to uh, ask the question. And it's my understanding from the testimony we've gone through here for the last uh, three or four hours is no one asked the question. Did you ever have a positive? No one asked the question of PCA. In fact, Mr. McKay, that one document you showed us, certificate of, uh, a certificate of analysis where it says no salmonella. In fact, that lot did have a positive salmonella. I mean, I'm not saying question every COA, but I would think someone would ask the question. And, and, and the reason why you're here, and I, I don't want to confuse the record, uh, like Ms. Isley and even Mr. Can, you're processors. You're not just strictly retailers. So who, who has the ultimate or the final responsibility well, we for were the, it? We're the distributor that, in that, this, that with this product. That's well, why I kept saying it's got to be the manufacturer. Well, you get the peanut butter from PCA. It yeah, goes to your plant. You slap your name. And no, we, don't, we didn't touch it. They put the label on. They sealed the case. Okay. We just bring it in. But it has your name on it. Don't you have some responsibility to make sure it's... I didn't say that we didn't have any... But in this case, we okay. are the distributor. And I really think the biggest uh, point should come with the, the manufacturer. We've got to help the manufacturers make better products. So retailers like Ms. Isley and distributors like myself and the thousands of but other... But Ms. Isley still processes the peanut... I mean, the well, only problem you had was in the peanut butter that you grind in your stores, right? Right, wasn't that it? Well, I'm, I'm referring to her as a retailer in general. The retailers and the distributors in general, the biggest responsibility has got to come with the manufacturer. Really? It you starts mean, there and ends there. It's sealed and closed. But don't you have some responsibility since you put your name on it? And sure. You, you, you're the one who really puts it in the... I'm not saying that we don't have that commerce. responsibility, but yes, but absolutely. But to help fix the system, co Congressman, yeah. to help fix it, we've got to focus mo mainly on the, the manufacturer. Okay. L let me ask this question, um, uh, Mr. McKay, if I may. Has Congress, uh, I'm sorry, has Kellogg, has Kellogg ever told suppliers they do not need to do finished product testing and instead just need to do environmental testing at facilities? Have you told your suppliers you don't have to do the finished product testing, just do your environmental testing? I don't believe so, but I would, I, I, I would think not. We can get you an absolute answer because I don't want to put it on record and find that I'm wrong, but my belief would be that that would not be the case. Okay. Okay. Either we read it or we saw it in some document and we're just trying to recall it. We've gone through the thousands of documents. Yeah. We thought some directive in there or a comment made that you would just don't worry about the final product, just do the environmental testing. You know, I, I, I don't believe so, but we can check. I, I would say, though, that if you have exhaustive environmental testing um, the prob and you have a food, food safety plan in place and you're following good manufacturing processes, uh, that the probability of you having a problem in the final food is mitigated significantly. But I would have to check that, uh, Congressman. But I, I don't believe that would be the case. Sure. If you'd give us the back, uh, yeah, sure. a possibility that would... would um like to see that because um, that bothers us if, if that was a situation because I think we all got responsibility through the whole chain from the grower all the way down to the person who puts it on the shelves to make sure that our food is safe. Yes, and just to add to your comment, I think, I think to your question is I think everyone has a responsibility in the chain and, and I think the more comprehensive uh, that we can make the food safety system in the U.S. through supplier, uh, through manufacturer, principally, uh, the more likely we are to, to really improve uh, the food safety in the U.S., which I believe is already very good, but uh, clearly can be improved. Well, from where we sit, this is what our 15th hearing in about uh, 18 months or so, just on food safety alone. That's not even calling the drug hearings we've had on drug safety. And, and I, I guess we're just bothered by no standards and uh, everyone's doing something a little different. We have three witnesses here who are all trying to do the right thing. They got three different sort of systems going. So we got to make sure we have some uniformity so we know what to look for. And then these uh, audits like on tab 23 there where Sam Leitsky gets noticed in December, there's going to be an audit. It'll take place on March 23rd, 24th. I got time to clean up the dead rodents. I got time to clean up the flies, the beetles, the rodent droppings, the feathers, whatever it may be. And, and, and that sort of got, got, has, must come to an end. So we're, I guess we're looking for it. I know you all gave us suggestions on what to do. We appreciate it. We do appreciate you all trying to help out in this matter and, and for your testimony today. And I want to thank you for being here, and, and thanks for 
putting up with our questions and uh, answering the questions under oath the best of your ability. And we look forward to some uh, further answers. All members will have 10 days to uh, submit additional questions for the record, so don't be surprised if we contact you and ask for some additional information. And uh, with that, that concludes our hearing. I want to thank once again all of our witnesses and members for their active participation day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Watching public affairs programming on C-SPAN 2. Up next, House Republicans hold a small business forum. After that, an oversight hearing examines the economic stimulus package. We'll hear from the person in charge of monitoring the spending.